Good afternoon. I hope your lunch was agreeable. Um, uh, no, I have not transformed into Andrea Calderaro, but Andrea is um, Miss Ing. No, and no, Andrea just contacted me to say that his train has been delayed, which must be a first in Japan. Um, <laughs> and could only happen when somebody had to be a discussant at, at this panel. So uh, I, will <clears throat> I will at least start, but this is a team effort and we're counting on everybody to, uh, to fill in Andrea's shoes for the moment. Andrea has assured me that he will send you comments on your papers. So, uh, so uh, we will start that process here. Okay, um, so it's my pleasure to launch the afternoon session of the GigaNet Annual Symposium. We have uh, three papers that are going to be delivered and I'll introduce all three straight away so that I don't have to talk in between the sessions, which takes up too much time. Um, so we have Radomir Bolgov, who will be presenting the paper on AI policies as a research domain, preliminary findings of publication pattern analysis. And secondly, on my extreme left, we have Robert Gorwa, who will be presenting um, a paper on European rules, European tools, mapping the institutional cultures of EU platform regulation. And in the middle, we have Sophie Hohenbaum, who will be presenting her paper, A New Social Contract for Data? Question um, mark. Without further ado, I will pass the floor to Radomir, um, who's going to start the presentations. I right, you get about 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this study uh, about uh, AI policies um, was conducted by me and my colleague Olga Filatova and uh, we uh, tried to look at the um, artificial intelligence policies and agencies as a research domain. Uh, is there any uh, specific, uh, specific feature of this research domain? Uh, any trends uh, in uh, these uh, studies? Uh, and uh, I will share the preliminary findings of this analysis. Uh, First of all, um, we try to um, understand uh, better the literature on AI policies uh, and we did it in three ways. Uh, we developed a descriptive analysis uh, of papers, articles and authors in order to determine some uh, trends. Uh, what is uh, AI policies? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, and what are the main directions of uh, research domain? Uh, uh, secondly, we analyze uh, the conceptual structure of this research domain. Uh, we uh, developed uh, the uh, framework for uh, using uh, bibliometric analysis and we have created the map uh, of main and highly important topics studied. Uh, we have analyzed and grouped these topics and we uh, try to suggest some um, uh, uh, future uh, research directions. Uh, so um, we tried to answer two research questions. Uh, what is um, a state of a state of art of AI policies reflected by m the most cited papers, uh, articles, most important authors, uh, sources, countries, etc. And uh, what are the case uh, key topics, uh, key concept uh, uh, in the literature on AI policies? So um, uh, the workflow uh, consists of uh, five steps, uh, five stages. As the first one is uh, developing of the study design. We have selected a database, uh, Google, Google Scholar, uh, because of the reasons of accessibility of this uh, database. Uh, and uh, the second step was uh, the data collection. We have searched Google Scholar based on the uh, research uh, uh, strategy. 
uh, 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 I will describe on the next slide. Um, uh, we have exported to EndNote format, uh, worked in a Mendeley database. Uh, this is uh, scientometric uh, um, uh, software uh, for these purposes. Uh, auto we have automatically checked for duplicates, uploaded the collection in BiblioShiny. It's uh, one more software for bibliometric analysis and exported the collection uh, in uh, Excel format. Uh, so totally we have found uh, 1545 publications, um, so um, the search was uh, conducted by country name uh, and keywords. Uh, uh, you can see these words on the slide, AI policy, strategy, politics, initiatives, regulating, governing, legislation, etc. Excuse me. Uh, and the th third stage was data analysis, screening titles in Google Scholar, deleting irrelevant records. Uh, we have uh, excluded uh, uh, preprints, uh, uh, forwards, uh, etc. Uh, we have uh, left only items in English, we have uh, deleted non-relevant publications, uh, for example, agriculture, education, health, etc. And uh, we have left uh, only 178 publications. So, the final collection was uploaded to BiblioShiny and then we used the uh, software of this uh, program uh, to visualize the data uh, and the interpretation. Um, uh, so we can see that uh, the uh, annual scientific production uh, was um, increased recently, uh, uh, but the increasing uh, stopped uh, during uh, during the last three years. Um, so we can uh, st uh, state that uh, the, this uh, research domain uh, achieved the, uh, some uh, major point. Uh, so the, the most relevant sources, uh, the author co-occurrence network, so we can see the uh, collaboration of the authors uh, and uh, we can uh, state that uh, uh, these um, groups of authors uh, work uh, separately from each other. Um, title network, just to illustrate, uh, and uh, the thematic map, uh, which consists of four uh, quadrants, uh, niche topic, uh, motor topic, uh, emerging and declining topics, and basic topics. So uh, we can interpret uh, this, uh, th that uh, such topics as uh, uh, artificial intelligence policies and China are increasing uh, emerging topics at the same time such topics as um, AI uh, policy uh, evaluation uh, is not uh, elaborated enough. Um, so we, we would like to see um, the further development of this topic, uh, for example. Uh, so um, as for the limitation of the study, so um, uh, we, uh, we should noting that uh, the choice of keywords was um, limit, uh, determined by our initial knowledge of this topic. So uh, this. Uh, uh, determine the uh, findings, and we can see this on the uh, on this. So uh, we used only Google Scholar. Uh, traditionally, Scopus and Web of Science are used for these uh, purposes, but 
uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, Google Scholar index uh, the books, uh, um, but at the same time, the data of Scopus and Web of Science are better and more diverse, of course. Um, and as for the conclusions, so we can state that uh, uh, s uh, such topics are not uh, studied enough uh, as uh, AI policy effects and uh, uh, so uh, w what are the uh, uh, outcomes of uh, AI policies, uh, they are negative or positive, uh, um, uh, what is AI policy uh, per se? Uh, so there are a few studies which uh, represent the answer on this question. And uh, the scholars focus predominantly on national strategies and uh, platforms as well as um, on the perspectives of uh, AI policies, so uh, the institutional uh, approach is uh, dominated, uh, dominating in these studies. Um, uh, AI policies previously studied uh, during the periods of certainty, certainty, but at the same time, uh, there are uh, some. Uh, 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 crisis such as pandemics, uh, conflicts, sanctions, environmental crisis. So we need to study this uh, this uh, um, uh, domain uh, in the contemporary uh, uh, contemporary uh, conditions. So that's it. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Radomir. <coughs> um, I'll move directly on to Robert, who will give his paper now. Robert, um, you don't have slides, so we're going to look oh. at you on a big screen behind you. Oh as my well. goodness! So brilliant. Okay. I don't know if I've ever been in such high definition before. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. It's nice to be in Kyoto, um, and yeah, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about some work in progress that I'm undertaking with my colleague, uh, the legal scholar, Elettra Bietti, who teaches at Northeastern. How's it, how's it looking up there? Um, and I'm gonna go old school with no slides, so apologies for this. Um, get ready to be extremely bored. Um, I'll try to sprinkle some jokes in to keep you on your toes. That was the, that was the first one. And we're gonna talk a little bit about European digital policy, um, which again, dry topic, but it's one which is really important at the moment, I think. We've all probably heard conversations about the many different overlapping things that uh, European countries, but also the European Commission as a political actor are pursuing from the Digital Services Act to the AI Act and other related regulations. And we've also probably all heard about things like the Brussels effect and the way that things that the EU is doing because of its market size are having potential transnational and transboundary impact. So it seems kind of clear that at this current moment, at least a lot of commentators are picking up on this, the EU is kind of the, the you know, portrayed as the leading uh, tech regulator of the moment. And this project, which is um, very much a work in progress, so I'm looking forward to hearing kind of comments and, and feedback on this, was born out of a bit of a dissatisfaction with some of the, the current work that we're seeing in this space, at least as far as the lack of good centralized resources that one can look at that try to provide a more kind of holistic assessment of what the EU is doing. Um, so for example, even if you're looking at like a subset of tech policy in the EU um, and you want a single resource that looks at the regulation of online content, so-called kind of platform regulation issues or other broader related issues, um, I think it's difficult to find something like this. And there's a reason for this, I think. Um, there's a number of challenges that we as a research space are dealing with, I think. Part of it is just the nature of the rapid development of EU policy making in the space, even for people like me who theoretically are supposed to be following this 
as my as my day job. Uh, I can barely keep up. So we're seeing a huge amount of policy efforts that are being developed um, on, across the internet stack, kind of from uh, the internet infrastructure to now more kind of assertive, even industrial policy relating things that talk about supply chains and semiconductors and uh, manufacturing processes of, of ICTs, as well as kind of the top of the stack, all sorts of different content related um, regulations uh, that are kind of at the application layer. And perhaps unsurprisingly, with all of this mobility, um, we're seeing a lot of disciplinary fragmentation, I think. So, you know, the data protection law scholars are doing their own thing, the intermediary liability legal scholars are doing their old thing, and the kind of problem is repeated um, from child safety, media policy, other, other related issues. And then kind of on the other side of the aisle, I come from a more political science background. There are also big and ongoing debates in the EU policy making literature on things like the resurgence of industrial policy and um, you know, the bigger kind of interventionist shift in EU industrial policy making on things like semiconductors. Um, a lot of folks in this room have worked on digital sovereignty debates and the role that that might be playing, for example, when it comes to cloud infrastructure pro uh, platforms and projects like Gaia-X. So on top of all of this movement, we're also seeing, um, I guess, just some structural features which make this a complicated space to navigate, which is how complicated the European Union is as a multi-level political actor. And even if you just look at the European Commission, which is the main kind of policy-making bureaucratic arm of the EU, um, there's a lot of complex politics that are kind of inside the hood that people don't see. Uh, and this actually makes it really kind of puzzling um, to understand what is going on, because there's different parts of the commission that have different agendas and are pursuing what oftentimes seem to be contradictory policies. So the project that we have just kind of embarked on this summer, and again, this is very early stage, um, it's probably a bit too ambitious for a single paper and might even become two papers, um, kind of has two main overarching goals. So the first thing is we're trying to understand EU digital policy making as a political project. Whether or not it's actually a coherent political project, that kind of remains to be seen. But we're trying to do a kind of descriptive and institutional mapping of all the different parts of this, um, this agenda and kind of what is going on. And then relatedly, part two is trying to look at what is going on from that descriptive point of view and try to map it on to some of the theoretical lenses that are being proposed in different uh, disciplines, different parts of this conversation um, to kind of explain the changes that we're seeing, uh, whether we want to call those logics or political mechanisms. So I'll go into those uh, a little bit in depth, um, maybe starting with, with the first kind of bucket. So what we've been doing in, in the project that we've started is we're taking a kind of institutionalist and um, political economic perspective of trying to think out who the key actors are and what is their policy toolbox. And we've been focusing specifically just on the last four years uh, of the von der Leyen Commission. So just one actor, one commission, but again, a time where we're seeing a huge amount of change. Um, so part of this is pretty basic descriptive work. We're mapping out the ecosystem of all the different parts of the commission that have digital policy competencies. Again, this is interesting because sometimes these aren't actually formal competencies if you look closely. Um, so there's directorate gener generals, for those of you who don't know, these are departments of the commission. Um, examples of relevant ones include uh, DG Grow, DG Connect, which is kind of the most classic telecommunications digital policy uh, one. There's Directorate Gener uh, General Justice, which has been working on issues like online hate speech and disinformation. There's DG Competition, which is working on competition issues. Um, and then there's also ones like DG Home, which is the kind of security focus actor of the commission, and interestingly has been getting more involved on issues like child safety and uh, terrorist content online in recent years, even though that isn't maybe formally part of its mandate. And after doing this kind of mapping, we've been trying to list and map out all the different policies that these DGs have been spearheading 
looking both at formal and informal regulatory tools. And then also, finally, we've been trying to kind of figure out the institutional features of these different policies across the different DGs. So basically, how do they do what they do from a kind of functional organizational perspective? And again, this is really interesting and also really complicated. Um, you know, the EU is famous for involving complex networks of different regulators. Sometimes this is decentered across member states. Um, we have different types of enforcement mechanisms. We have different legal justifications, basically questions of institutional design that are at play here. So we're trying to just understand that from a descriptive way um, in a kind of more coherent uh, mechanism. And one of the things that we're seeing here is something I've already alluded to, which is basically that a lot of divergence in EU digital policy seems to at least be partially explained by the different actors that are driving them and the different interests that we can assume um, those actors have. So there was just some interesting news today, for example, about the new European Media Freedom Act. And you might look at this and say, hey, um, you know, doesn't the European Commission have a stated interest in combating disinformation, uh, and it's something that they've been doing through different parts of the commission uh, for some years, um, but there are some analyses and arguments being made that this European Media Freedom Act is actually directly contradictory to the goals of um, some of the things that they've done under voluntary codes, like the Disinfo Code of Conduct. So anyway, again, part of the just simple kind of institutional analysis here is that that discrepancy uh, at least makes partial sense um, when you know that it's different parts of the commission, different actors um, motivated by different goals. And again, that only goes so far. Um, we're trying to just understand also which parts of the commission prefer different types of institutional arrangements. So for example, you know, DG Home substantively has been delegating a lot of stuff through um, kind of technical solutions like uh, automated moderation. These are often called upload filters through the draft CSAM regulation and also the terrorist content regulation. DG Justice likes voluntary codes of conduct. Again, we can talk a little bit about this. Okay, and then part two of this paper, and I, I'm almost at 10 minutes already, so I'll be really quick. Um, but basically, this is, I think, the, the perhaps more interesting piece for, the, for this room, and it's something I'd be interested in talking um, with, with you all a little bit about, is basically trying to map this types of um, descriptive analysis onto some of the major theoretical lenses and approaches that people have been advancing um, to try to explain what we're seeing right now in terms of changes in, in EU digital policy. So a major line of scholarship that is coming out, especially of um, European legal circles, is this resurgence of interest in European digital constitutionalism. We can talk a little bit more about that. We have uh, public policy scholars that are looking a lot at industrial policy. And thirdly, I think we have a third broad bucket of critical scholars who are looking at digital capitalism, uh, digital neoliberalism, digital ordo liberalism. And maybe, you know, these are big generalizations, but basically they're kind of, we could think of these as explanations that are shifted or are based around norms, geopolitics, and markets. And we're still working on this part of the project, um, but what's interesting is that all of these different lenses have different strengths, and they look at different pieces of what is a very big digital policy ecosystem. So very quickly, um, the structural kind of analyses of digital capitalism, I think, provide helpful explanations of what's going on in terms of like an inter-actor competition perspective. They capture struggles between firms and political actors. They also kind of capture internal struggles within um, the EU policy just generally, and it's kind of trends, um, uh, and I guess it's internal struggles between, for example, market delegating mechanisms that have always been part of the single market project to kind of um, more interventionist efforts to curb the excesses of the market. Um, we then have industrial policy approaches that I think make a lot of sense when we're trying to explain certain geopolitical or geoeconomic policies relating to, for example, the reshoring of supply chains, um, digital sovereignty projects like Gaia-X. But those types of uh, analyses, I guess, are less good at explaining the minute, minute details of the kind of procedural bureaucratic frameworks um, that the EU is developing or other parts of the EU are developing for online content, for example. 
And that's something that digital constitutionalism scholars have been, uh, have been doing in the EU, um, describing new layers of rules that are being kind of layered on top of industry behavior in an area like content moderation. And what I think is interesting here, and again, this is, is not fully developed yet, is that there are a number of kind of interesting contradictions between these different approaches and also some weaknesses um, when you com compare them in this way. So, for example, something like digital constitutionalism coming at it from a, a political science point of view, there's an argument that it underplays uh, actor agency in terms of how policy change happens. Maybe it over relies on uh, judicial actors as agents of change in terms of policy making in the EU. Uh, maybe it, it kind of treats uh, markets uh, too abstractly and isn't um, engaging enough with these broader political forces like geopolitics that are kind of inherent in the industrial policy approach. So yeah, so that's kind of a very high level bird's eye view of what we're trying to do in this project. Again, um, it's still in early stages. And I think the move that we're gonna make towards the end is basically trying to see whether or not we can argue for a more kind of comprehensive synthesizing framework that pulls in insights from all of these um, different frameworks in terms of thinking about digital political economy uh, in the EU uh, across the kind of scopes of norms, markets, and geopolitics. So, yeah, thanks so much. Um, excited for the discussion. Thanks very much. Sophie, there, you are a co host, right? Uh, hello. Could you please, Sophie, a co host? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sophie Hogenboom, and I'm a PhD student at the United Nations University, CRIS, which is situated in Bruges, Belgium, uh, and the Free University of Brussels. And today I want to talk about a paper that I've uh, been working on in which I reflect upon a social contract in relation to data and the likeliness of such a contract to occur. Uh, what inspired my uh, paper was the fact that I kept seeing different types of actors talking about uh, the need to establish a new social contract in relation to data. Uh, for example, the World Bank uh, in 2021 uh, had a re uh, published a report, Data for Better Lives, in which they not only reflected upon the need to establish a new social contract, but also uh, proposed a specific mechanism for data sharing. Uh, but I've also found similar debates uh, in academia uh, and also among journalists. And um, this raised the question for me, at least, um, all right, we're talking a lot about it, but is, is there a possibility of such a thing to occur? And um, if currently those conditions are present? Uh, I would first like to talk a little bit about what a social contract is, just to make sure that everyone can follow. Um, a social contract is often perceived as a written agreement geared towards the installment of a political authority uh, in, um, with its purpose to foster a social cooperation. The document must raise the community out of a state of nature, meaning that prior there was no or not a sufficient uh, political, uh, overarching political authority. And thirdly, the members of the community need to enter the agreement voluntarily. I think most of us uh, think, when we think about a uh, social contract, we often think about the nation state. Of course, we um, are often familiar with the works of Locke, um, Rousseau, Kant, etc. cetera. Um, however, this has also often been questioned, the, the validity of the social contract in relation to the nation state. It's often referred to as the myth of the social contract, as uh, people struggle to find any sort of empirical evidence of such a social contract to exist, uh, which has also been described by Durkheim in 1933, who said that the conception of a social contract has no relations to the facts. Um, in recent years, scholars have been uh, starting to look at, are actually arguing against this and saying, no, a social contract exists. However, we can't really find it on the nation state level, but we can find it uh, on sub-nation uh, level and uh, global levels. Uh, when it comes to social contract in relation to the digital sphere, we see 
often people writing and proposing um, a social contract in relation to the digital realm in general or specific parts of it. Um, this is often considered to be a result of the fact, and you can see it on the quote on the slide as well, that sometimes the digital realm has been described as an undeveloped frontier, which is reminiscent of a lock in the state of nature, meaning that we need to establish, an, or there is a need to establish a political authority. Um, so we currently are seeing, especially also in academia, many people are proposing a social contract, for example, in relation to virtual worlds, to privacy, uh, to AI, and, um, a specific, and uh, for data, of course. So this for me raised the question, okay, we're talking a lot about these things, but is there a possibility for this to arise? And um, in the tradition of social theorists, there's not much attention being paid to the conditions. However, there is one theory that uh, I used in my paper, and this was proposed by Alexander Fink. And he uh, described, he looked at uh, the, um, the cases of social contracts that we can see uh, empirically, and he uh, drafted this uh, theory. For according to Alexander Fink, uh, for a social contract to arise, we first need to have a community that needs to have similar preferences in relation to a public good. Uh, secondly, the members of the group need to share some common social norms for them to be able to come together and draft such a document. And third, Alexander Fink focuses on the size of the group, uh, as he says that how the smaller the group, the likeliness of a social contract to occur will increase because there are uh, lower uh, decision and decision-making decision decision costs and monitoring costs. So what I've done in the paper is I've structured it among, alongside these three um, uh, three conditions that Alexander Fink has proposed. Uh, I will keep this part brief because in my paper I go very much in depth, but I would like to um, to not bore you with all all the specificities. So first of all, I've looked at the first condition. So the community needs to have a relatively similar preference. Of course, this is where a global social contract becomes a little bit difficult because the community is, of course, so big that we can identify very different uh, pr preferences in relations to public good, such as commercial uh, and security. Uh, however, uh, we can identify some parts of some data, so not all data, but some parts of data, where we can identify that actually many actors do have the similar preference. Um, and this is what I found mostly about data that we can use for the betterment of society. This is also following um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance, who has made a distinction between all data and community data. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, community data refers to uh, data that can be useful for the fulfillment of human rights and the attainment of uh, sust the sustainable development goals. Um, so, to conclude, uh, on the first condition, um, I found that uh, if we follow the theory of Alexander Fink, the community, of course, has very different similar, uh, very different preferences in, in relation to all data. However, we can identify some similarities in the treatment of community data. The second condition uh, that I've reflected upon is the fact that the members need to share so, uh, common social norms. Again, because of the size of the global community, we can, of course, identify varying uh, social norms. I've looked at the differences between collectivist and individualist societies. Of course, the definition of a common good, right? If we say we want to make, we want to use data that helps the betterment of society, we need to find a consensus of what that means, which um, creates obstacles. The third one, uh, regards to privacy, we can also identify that privacy is highly contextual. Um, norms, sorry, norms around privacy is highly con contextual. And uh, fourth, the um, familiarity with the concept of a social contract also impacts the um, yeah, the likeliness of people to be aware of what a social contract is and thus also make plans to create a social contract. Uh, so to conclude, um, I would say that the different social norms could hinder the creation of a global social contract. However, we could look at maybe not immediately go on a global level, but maybe focus more on regional initiatives or data, um, a topic focus. So for example, a global social contract on health data. There has been some progress in that field already. Then the third condition is the size of the uh, sorry is the size of the community, 
And of course, according to Alexander Fink, as I just said, the smaller the group, the lower the decision-making costs are. I, un I agree with this. However, I do think that, especially because of the fact that data is, uh, or the, sorry, the internet and digital, the digital realm actually makes us to be so much more connected with each other. So that's a way that um, I still think it would be possible. And uh, on top of that, if we would propose, if we would be able to make something like this on a global level, uh, we would have a lot of resources in terms of people and money to do so. So to conclude, uh, I've looked, I reflected upon what are the conditions needed, uh, according to Alexander Fink, for a social contract to, re to arise uh, in relation to data. And what I have found is, of is not very surprising that for now it seems too ambitious to to um, sorry it wouldn't be I w uh, sorry it would not be very likely that in the following years we will see the creation of a global social contract in relation to all data. However, as I said earlier, in terms of community data, I do see some possibilities, and I do think it's important to reflect upon this uh, as we could make we could use this step to protect the full potential of data for the betterment of society. Thank you for listening. I mean the second. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> I'm now in the head of Andrea. Um, thank you very much for the papers. Thank you very much to the authors uh, for presenting them. Um, I'm going to go through the papers one by one um, with a few comments um, and um, and trying to kind of um, push towards a discussion with the audience as well here. So. Um, Radomir, thank you very much for the, the, the paper that you presented. Um, it struck me as a, a very a promising reflection on, on, on looking at this from the literature perspective, so looking at this on what people are saying about AI. I found that very interesting. The methodology is intriguing, um, but I would have thought that the methodology worked on um, larger numbers, and you, you spent a lot of time reducing the numbers. So I, I was wondering about that, because I think that, 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 that you know, there is some element of qualitative research that you could also so bring into to a, a smaller number. I think you, you said you got down to 170 in the end. Eh? Yeah. So, so <clears throat> that's one thing. The second thing is um, it would be useful probably, and this is boring geeky talk, I think, but it would be useful to, to as you mentioned, also look towards Scopus and those other databases which, um, uh, which, which I think you can still access for free. I don't know whether that's, okay, you can't, okay. It's just because I only do it at university, um, but it may be interesting to 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 expand the the database uh, list that you have. Also, I was a bit struck by something you said um, when you said I've removed all literature relating to agriculture, education, and health, um, and yet I think most people, when they write about AI, they write about AI and a field. Uh, agriculture, education, or health. Um, and so I was thinking, oh, why did he take them out and not leave them in, or, or put even more in? Um, and that leads to the, 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 the bigger question, which is about the choice of code words, or the cho choice of keywords, because I think um, AI is not, no, not everything that is called AI is AI, and not everything that isn't called AI is not AI. Um, there you go, that's a, a surreal comment from a discussant. But it's just, I remember that there was a big discussion a few years ago, that, well, why don't we call it cybernetics? And, um, what's the, what's, what, why are we using this term artificial intelligence to describe this when actually a lot of the things that are going on, machine, you know, a lot of these concepts are actually used by different scholars in different disciplines to actually mean something else. So, um, that might be something that that obviously limits the words that you use in the paper and, and that limits the scope of the discussion that you can have, which also um, reflects on the choice of journals. I'm very glad that you chose our flagship journal, the Telecommunications Policy, <coughs> which we have a special issue with every year um, in the list. But um, I was also wondering, you know, what was the rationale for the choice of those literatures? 
Okay, so that's just some thoughts for you. Um, I think I've got everything from my notes, good. Um, second, Robert, thanks very much for this paper. Um, makes me realize that I should have written more. Uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, really interesting to see you try and map out uh, the European Union's digital policy space. Um, I have tried and failed myself, so I wish you all the best, but I don't hope you do. <laughs> no, no I, I do hope you do it. Um, there is one other thing that kind of struck me, um, that actually a lot of EU policy, full stop, is now dealing with digital, right? So your mapping might turn out to be just, okay, what is the EU doing as a whole, right? Um, <clears throat> because I find that even if you focus on one DG, you find out that they're involved in other projects and things. So it might be interesting to look, when you're looking just at the commission, for example, to look at, okay, how does uh, this would be really interesting. How does DG Connect get involved in inter-service consultations or something like that? How do they try and push forward a sort of um, research agenda, uh, a, not a policy agenda from that perspective? That might be interesting. And obviously you have the tensions across different DGs, right? In the sense that there are different approaches, different understandings of what we mean um, and traditionally, DG Connect has been very tech-oriented, um, and, and DG Justice and so on have been much more legalistic, of course. Um, but I think that kind of interaction um, is evolving very much. Um, I think also one of the things you probably want to look into, um, because you focus on the, although you said the EU, you focus a lot or you talk a lot about the European Commission. I think the European External Action Service is doing quite a bit in digital policy now, um, engaging across. And you do have, of course, the Parliament's role in in this. And uh, you know, you can also say something about the Council. Sorry to all of those who aren't involved in EU stuff, but that's uh, that's uh, that's one of the consequences of this. Um, so the other thing you you talked about the EU as a tech regulator in your introduction. And yeah, that seems to be a kind of a, a, at least a discourse that is emerging in the mainstream. Uh, but I would like you to critically also look at that. I mean, Milton and I were just at a workshop a couple of weeks ago that was trying to look at the, the role of the, the US, China, and, and other powers in, in, in manipulate, or no, in, in shaping the way the EU looks at this, right? And it's clear that the EU wants to be seen as the tech regulator, right? And maybe it does take tech, uh, uh, maybe it does take regulatory decisions to that sort of level. But it might be interesting to, to actually critically look at that as well and see how much of this, due to the way that the EU works in terms of policy formulation, may be based not on tech regulation, but on interest representation in the development of tech regulation. And therefore, I, I would kind of, this is me not arguing against you doing the mapping, because it needs to be done, but it's kind of saying, well, you, you need to look in these specific cases. Maybe it would be good to think about one or two specific cases uh, of policy, maybe one very obvious policy and one less obvious policy. And um, uh, there's quite a lot there. Um, also, you mentioned that you only want to look from 2019 onwards, and you, you're obviously aware that there's been a massive shift uh, since that period, so that's a good, good thing to do. But I think it's, there is a history and a legacy to all of this, and it's important to kind of bear that in mind, because that does have implications for this turn. Yes, there are path dependencies very much there. Okay, uh, I'll leave that there for the moment. We'll go on Sophie. Um, of course, we've, we've talked briefly about this paper before, so this is, um, this, well, my comments will come as a surprise. <laughs> um, so, um, first of all, thanks. I was wondering, um, you've, you, obviously you've drawn this upon the literature on social contracts. Um, I was wondering, at a certain point during your presentation, I was thinking, um, 
you mentioned that there has to be a vacuum, there has to be nothing that avoid before a social contract is signed. But obviously we live in a period of social contract, so we have to rewrite a contract. And for me, in contract law, you can always change your contract, right? So I was wondering how that reflects you know, on, on your reflections there, because we do have social contracts that do exist, right? And now you want to create a functional social contract, in a sense, right? So I was wondering about that. Um, I also thought, so, I mean, I, this is not a comment to you, but it's a comment to Fink. Um, and I was wondering whether you'd thought critically about how Fink looks at these issues of size, and functionality, because for me, um, the question of size is obviously incompatible with what you were describing. You know, a, a social contract is not between a small group of people, in your case, but it's uh, over a larger scale. And then, of course, in terms of function, it's also vice versa as well for you. So I was wondering whether you would actually rather write a response to think. Um, first, rather than going into this story, because I, I really like the idea of you reflecting on what the World Bank is doing and so on and so forth, but I'm wondering if before you do that, you need to have the theorizing up to speed, and so rather than saying, okay, let me talk about think, criticize think, and then go on and do uh, a justification for what the World Bank is doing, rather say, okay, let me just spend some time reflecting on the, the critique of the social contract. Okay, um, are there questions from the floor? There are questions from the floor. Please just, uh, yes, um, organize yourself in an open mic fashion. Thanks, Janet. Okay, yeah, my name is uh, Jan Ocholte, uh, Leiden University. Uh, question for, for Radomir. And, uh, thanks for that very much. I was wondering if you could do a little bit of assessment of what you found. In other words, when you look at the trends, did you find that there are certain things which are encouraging, and are there certain aspects which worry you? Um, I, to give one example, I think you said that most of the literature you found was looking at national responses and national strategies. So is the academic literature not looking at regional and global strategies, for example? Um, Question for, 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 for Sophie, There's, can you tell us why, I'm not saying that it's not the case, okay, but it's, 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 can you be more explicit why one would be concerned about looking at a social contract? Why is it important and why is it in, uh, interesting? Um, and would we necessarily expect a social contract in this sphere to take the same shape as the traditional state-centered constitutional kind of form. In other words, the fact that we don't have a, a United Nations Charter or a national constitution, does that mean there's not a social contract? Could you have in this sphere a very decentered social contract, for example, just because governance is looking different? Thanks. Since Ramiro is standing up, we might as well give him the mic. And, and if we then take three questions between the three of you plus Mike. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ramiro Alvarez Huarte from CELE. Um, Radomir, I have a question similar to the one that Jamal posed in terms of uh, selection of terms. By selecting AI something, you've selected an acronym. And uh, I think with that decision, you are discarding the pe a period in which people did not talk about AI because it was not a thing yet. So I wonder if that was a conscious decision uh, uh, to sort of control the sample that you would get to get only the policy-related stuff. Uh, I mean, when I read your paper, my intuition was that I would have included artificial intelligence, for example, but that would perhaps have led you in a different direction. Um, I have another question for Robert. Um, I, I love the project you're engaging in. You mentioned that you've found different political issues within the commission. Um, I wonder if you're at a stage in which you can share that with us or we have to wait for it because this is coming from, 
I work in a research center based in the Global South. We're trying to look into the DSA because of the obvious impact it will have in the world, but especially in Latin America. It has also it has already been used as an inspiration to produce bills in Costa Rica and Chile, and. Uh, that mapping that you're working on, it's essential to us. So I wonder if you can share with us a little bit more about those political issues within the Commission. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, um, my name is Nick Benaquista. I'm from the Center for International Media Assistance at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, DC. I think my question may be identical, in fact, to Ramiro's question, uh, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. Uh, so Dr. Gorwa, you know, you mentioned the, the contradictions uh, in the sort of EU constitutionalist perspective that's playing out uh, in these regulatory approaches. You used the, the contradiction in particular between um, uh, the uh, Disinformation Code of Conduct uh, and the Media Freedom Act as an example of that, which is of particular interest to my organization and our work. And I think this is where Ramiro and I are probably asking a very similar question. Could you just say a few words about the constellation of actors and the different perspectives, how you're accounting for those contradictions, including the one you see uh, in the Code of Conduct and the Media Freedom Act? Because I agree that sort of analysis would be really interesting to many of us. Thanks. I suggest we go in the order of presentations. Okay. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, I will start uh, from the second one um, about uh, the keywords. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yes, this uh, was a limitation of our approach. So, um, the, the, the initial uh, the, 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 the choice of keywords was determined by our initial knowledge of this uh, domain so uh, this strategy uh, should be developed uh, thank you for your suggestion uh, and as for the second uh, f first question uh, by my order um, uh, about uh, about the studies on global uh, uh, strategies on AI. Uh, so uh, yes, there were few studies on this uh, on this uh, uh, topic. Uh, by uh, at the same time, uh, only uh, several studies. But uh, we have worked with uh, uh, big massives of information. So uh, in order to find uh, this. Uh, um, uh, to, to analyze these uh, approaches, uh, we uh, work uh, individually f with these uh, um, uh, articles, and uh, uh, so this is a uh, direction for uh, our further research. Uh, thank you for your suggestion. Off. Yeah, thank you so much to you both for those questions. I'm heartened that this seems like a potentially interesting project. Um, I fear I don't have that much yet to reveal in terms of um, concrete findings. And part of that is that we're still kind of diving into things and collecting data. Um, this also relates to your question, Jamal, in terms of trying to get a better picture uh, in terms of what the commission is actually doing. And of course, this is really complicated. In a bunch of the other work I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of freedom of information requests and I've been trying to get internal emails and um, I use that in some past work on the development of national kind of platform regulatory uh, projects like um, the German Nets DG, for example, um, to try to get a little bit of a better picture of these contradictions, not just in terms of what different parts of the commission were telling to each other in the things that they helpfully didn't redact when I requested them, um, but also kind of getting a bit of a vision of the different institutional veto points, uh, especially in terms of like the negotiation of application of these policies between member states and the commission, which is really, really key. So. I don't know. I think what I would say, and, and this is just pure conjuncture, this is kind of how I've been thinking a little bit about the EU and some of the work I've been doing, is that I get this feeling that a lot of the, at least platform regulation agenda, is about kind of adding tools 
to the toolbox. And then these get used down the line strategically by specific actors in certain situations, right? And this is why, for example, I think a lot of uh, concern, which is often um, coming from the right place, um, and I think is, is completely bang on, for example, about the prospective human rights impacts of certain legislative approaches. You know, we can think about the upload filters conversation or the conversation that thankfully has slowed a little bit, but the conversation around um, embedding, for example, rapid takedown times into a lot of the uh, content regulation that the EU is doing. Um, and contrasting that with the actual application of what's going on in the ground where hopefully this is not actually used, it's just more like a potential cudgel that can be used theoretically. And again, that doesn't hearten um, folks who are worried about human rights impacts um, to know that like this is a tool that hopefully a regulator that is normatively constrained is not going to use. Um, but I think it's an important part of what is what is going on, which is just that there are a lot of tools and then the outcome is going to be politics. But I know that isn't necessarily helpful to folks who are actually dealing with these issues on the ground. So I'd love to talk more about what you guys are actually seeing uh, in the weeds on this. All right. Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, it kind of um, reminds me of the comment that you also just made, Jamal, about the, the already existing social contracts. Um, indeed, uh, I think we could keep it the way it is, and it's in a decentralized way. However, what I find in the literature, and also, to be honest, I don't really have a personal opinion yet, I just reflect it upon, but what I found in the literature is that there is a worry that the data um, is, if we leave it up to sort of the analog social contract, if I can call it like that, uh, that there is a potential risk that we don't use the full potential that the data can have for the, um, yeah, for example, the sustainable development goals or other goals that kind of cross uh, borders. And so I think that is an argument that you can make that perhaps we should establish, and that's why I also specifically mentioned community data, so not maybe old data, but data that we, that we can identify as this is useful for the global community. Um, and yeah, that's what I found in the literature, that some people are arguing that the, the we need to uh, yeah, establish that, and it kind of into, ties into these debates that we also see in digital commons, where people are trying to, I think, sort of frame or reconstruct data as a public good, and not only as a public good of one nation or of a company in one nation, but that it, uh, we might need to think about it as a global public good, and for that we might need a social contract to um, yeah, build a mechanism for that. That's uh, what I wanted to add. I see that you would like to ask a question. Please go ahead. I'm Michael Nelson with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and this question is for Robert. Uh, one of my colleagues is Anu Bradford, who's written a new book called The D Digital Empires. It's, uh, it builds upon her first book, which is the, the Brussels Effect. We've been having some discussions about uh, the lack of digital leadership, and in particular how both in Europe and in the U.S. Congress and in some of our state legislators, legislatures, you have this process where there's a goal, which is to you know, regulate AI or deal with hate speech, and everybody has their way of doing it. Everything gets thrown into the, the draft, and nobody actually makes it into a coherent whole. I started my career in Washington working in the U.S. Senate in 1988. Back then, there was a real pride of authorship. The, the draftsmen who were writing legislation wanted to make sure that they wrote consistent legislation. And if they didn't, the people in the administration would point out the inconsistencies because they were going to have to implement it. That seems to be gone on both sides of the Atlantic. We're getting these pieces of legislation that are just a series of aspirations, and no one seems to notice that some of them directly contradict themselves. Well, actually, let me correct that. I notice it, and you notice it, but the parliamentarians don't notice it. So my hope is that you can give us some reason for optimism. Is there any mechanism 
Is there anything that might change this tide and force people to build a coherent, consistent whole rather than just throwing together a lot of things that make them feel good? Um, if you want to see more about what I've written on this, you can go to Twitter. I'm at Mike Nelson, because I was the first Mike Nelson, and I use the hashtag when policies collide. Literally dozens of examples of this from both the US and, and Europe. Thanks, Mike. Um, Hi, I'm uh, Lee McKnight from Syracuse University. I've been following Mike around for a decade, so uh, happy to do so again. Um, so this is a comment and a question for Sophie in particular. Uh, your work on, uh, or your hope perhaps, that there might be a, uh, some chances for getting a social contract around uh, at the community level. Uh, I'm wondering if you've thought at all about uh, community networks per se as perhaps the instrument or vehicle in which there could be uh, data governance regimes uh, embedded uh, that could be either embarked, uh, created generally or specifically uh, by, the, by the community, if that's something that's come to mind. Now I have to do, like Mike, uh, my advertisement, our session at six o'clock on um, leave no one behind, the importance of data and development. Exactly, we'll discuss some of these issues in particular as we work across community internet and community networks in Africa with my colleague, Professor Daniel Smith, who I promised to embarrass by putting on the spot right now. Thank you. Um, sorry, if I, uh, I could, yeah, wait, wait one second before I sit down, uh, before I answer the question. You mean community networks as in that the com a community makes a network themselves? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All right, okay. Um, yes, I think, well, um, I think both can work simultaneously. We still need to work on parts of the world that are not connected. We still need to work on parts of the world where maybe the, the needs or what I also mentioned, right, the, what is a public good or what is betterment of society might also depends on the context. Uh, and over, let's say some community might focus, puts emphasis on other aspects than, than, than another would do. So yes, I think that could be very much a possibility. However, I think the combining of the data sets after that, like after establishing that, is so vital that that can, I think that can work in tandem. Like it doesn't have to be either or, I think. But I will attend your session for sure. One, one just thing that came to mind when you were speaking earlier was, um, I mean, maybe it's not in the language of social contract, but there's been some interesting work looking at like procurement at the public level in municipal governments. Right, so like this Barcelona model where they had a, at least in theory, an idea that, lo that companies that came in and provided, for example, like transportation platforms would have to share the data with the local community, which isn't always the case. So maybe that's also a form of like a localized social contract. Yes, no, definitely. And that, but that's what I meant with, I think we could maybe stack them on top of each other almost. Uh, but still, I think it's important to them make sure that we do share them among each other. But yeah, definitely. And um, thanks so much um, to the question, was it Mike, Mike for, um, for your question. And yeah, I mean, two parts. So I think, first of all, um, I had a chance to, I, I met Anu Bradford earlier this year in, in, uh, at a conference at NYU, and she was talking about the new book, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, but it looks, it looks interesting. And I think, in a way, kind of, I guess part of what we're seeing and what we're trying to explore in this project, right? So she ideal types um, the US, EU, and China as a kind of, uh, she calls it a market-driven, a rights-driven, and a state-driven um, or security-driven vision of tech policy. And I think much of what we're seeing is kind of actually all three of those modes inside each jurisdiction probably and contestation between these different things. And I think what, um, I guess what we're seeing in the EU is a lot of contradictions that are driven by different actors with different interests on each and in different camps like this. Um, so I can point to also Henry Farrell and Abe Newman's work on this, right? Looking at transatlantic networks of security actors on data protection in the EU. Um, but I think, you know, this is another 
good example if you look at, for example, the, the quite controversial uh, child sexual abuse material regulation, draft regulation that the commission has been working on. And you know, you look at, at that um, where at least critics are writing that this is going to have a profound issue on um, user rights, on user privacy, end-to-end -end encryption, which another part of the commission is working on through the Digital Services Act. How do we think about that? And again, I think it's about actor coalitions. And one of the things that is really interesting about the CSAM regulation, for example, is that the main actors actually that are really driving that are US actors who have kind of seized the EU as a global regulator due to the Brussels effect and are trying to kind of hijack that. Um, so I have a lawfare piece on this. I can, I can, uh, I can share it. Um, but there's been some interesting analysis from Netzpolitik, the German um, journalism NGO, recently about Thorn, which is uh, a startup slash civil society organization started by Ashton Kutcher to lobby on child protection issues. And they're one of the major actors that have been kind of building alliances in the EU for, for this kind of policy. Because they know it's you know easier and probably more effective to do so than at the US uh, federal level. Um, but on the second part of your question about matters for optimism, I don't often have a lot of optimism, um, but I think if there is something to come back to, it's the fact that we're just seeing so much change uh, in a relatively recent period of time. And just from a bird's eye view, if we're looking at content regulation, for example, and the amount of transparency and also the amount of resources that are being invested by industry to handle this right now, it's a complete different ball game from, let's say, 2016. And I think the outcome there has been probably good for, for users. So I think there's some reason for hope, um, just given how new this regulatory field is. Maybe. It might be muddled, but I think I'm um, hopefully there's a there's an upward trajectory long term. There I add something. So I, I'd heard from the commission that um, a lot of the, they're aware of these inconsistencies and they just say, yeah, but we wait for the courts, as you just said, Mike. The different courts take different yeah. The, well, when it's EU legislation or DSA, then yeah, it should be the EU. This ECJ that deals with it. Are there any last questions? Are there any last comments that you would like to make to each other? Good luck. <laughs> no, okay, excellent. So that, that's brilliant because we're now back on time and we even have time to grab coffee that's just around the corner. If somebody needs to go to the bathroom, we'll grab coffee. Um, that will be next door, but please be back in our three minutes um, where we can start the next session. Thanks very much to the three of you and to all the questions. Hello. Oh, no. Now we're good. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome for the panel, the fourth panel at the GigaNet Symposium. Um, and this panel is going to discuss um, a little bit of digital sovereignty, digital colonialism, and the regional mechanisms uh, that are going to be worked, especially in the South, uh, with Africa, Latin America, and Asia Pacific experiences. Um, I do have uh, two preliminary notes before we jump in for the panel, the first one, I want to applaud the work done by Jamal, who is just uh, on the back right now and was in the previous session. Uh, Jamal has been leading the work of the program committee. Uh, it's really a huge effort and a great leadership with high stamina and efficiency. So thank you very much, Jamal. I want to take the time to applaud you. <laughs> and then uh, the second um, uh, preliminary note is that I arrived in Kyoto at 1 a.m. coming straight from Brazil and it's 3 uh, a.m. there so <laughs> I don't know how much coherent I'm going to stay in the panel but anyway uh, keep me responsive um, and without further ado let me start with the first uh, presenters uh, I would like to have Adio Dinika he's online in Zoom if we can have him uh, on screen I have the presentation. Can we make him also um, th 
his video. Can we we have Adio Adio Dinica? He is one of the participants in Zoom. Is it possible to pin his video? Okay, so while they're sorting this out, uh, I might start uh, with uh, Dennis. So let me introduce them. <laughs> they are going to present their paper about regional internet governance and post-colonial consciousness. Oh my God, I'm not coherent at all. <laughs> and Rickon him uh, analysis of the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms. And I have here uh, on site Dennis Ridiker and uh, online Adio Dinica, and they are co-presenting their paper. Please, Dennis, start. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for organizing this fantastic panel. Um, uh, we look forward to giving our paper, um, a paper that is um, work in progress, um, um, but relatively far already uh, progressed. We'll be talking today about uh, regional internet governance and post-colonial consciousness, particularly a Nkumian uh, analysis and critique uh, of African uh, um, internet governance, specifically also focusing on one document, the African Declaration of Internet Rights and Freedoms. Um, what, what brought us to um, this paper? What's our origin story? Essentially, uh, Dio is um, a, an expert for African digital infrastructure, for digital labor. Um, he works on AI, on platforms, on internet infrastructure, uh, an expert in digital sovereignty, particularly with respect to Africa. Um, and I uh, work on human rights online, internet bills of rights, and what we heard earlier already, the concept of digital constitutionalism. Um, in my dissertation, I worked on uh, a number of those initiatives, these digital bills of rights, and how they we, were being made. Uh, and when Adio and I talked about the African um, Declaration of Internet Rights and Freedoms, we realized that there's really something to analyze, to, to bring our different um, perspectives together, and so this is why we do this um, paper. Um, the research questions are both descriptive, some are descriptive, some are more analytical. We ask um, how the document came about, um, what were the reasons to draft it in the first place, what sets it apart from other documents, what's the content, um, and how does the advocacy with it work, how does the impact, if we can ever in political science uh, measure the impact of something, um, how, what kind of impact does the document have. Analytically, we're interested in questions such as, is that really a pan-African document? And what does it mean to be a pan-African declaration? Um, why is that important to, that a document on human rights online is, is pan-African specifically? Um, and how does that all relate to African digital sovereignty? This project, this disclaimer or kind of acknowledgement, uh, is uh, partly funded, a small part funded, by an EU project, the Remit project, um, and I just need to mentioned this, very important. What, what are we going to talk about today in the next um, eight or so minutes? Um, we quickly discuss a conceptual framework with a few key terms, um, to shortly describe our empirical strategy and then um, talk about um, the findings and the discussion that we present in the paper uh, and then also outline some limitations uh, and ideas for future research. On the right hand side you actually see Kwame Nkrumah, the, the core thinker that we um, adopted for this paper. We'll, we'll talk more about uh, him in a little bit. The general three concepts that we try to relate for this paper uh, are a post-colonial critique, particularly the thinking of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, then digital constitutionalism, this kind of ideology um, that we need to adapt fundamental rights and principles to the digital environment, um, and the um, so-called digital bills of rights that have come up in recent um, years, uh, and thirdly, African digital um, sovereignty. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Adio now. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, Adio, we can hear and see you on the screen. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Thanks, Tennis, for that. So quickly moving on to the Nkrumahian post-colonial critique. Basically, Nkrumah was the first um, prime minister and the first president of independent Ghana and a towering figure when we talk about African, the African liberation movement as a whole. So Nkrumah penned um, this book 
neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, in which he laid out his ideas and his vision for, for, um, for, a, for what he believed is true African independence. And so it is because of his ideas and his role in African independence that in this day, when we're talking about internet freedoms, internet rights, digital sovereignty, there is no um, more suitable thinker from the African continent to think about than Nkrumah. So what Nkrumah spoke about is that Nkrumah was basically saying that in most cases, when Africa is juridically free, but really is still under the hegemony of erstwhile colonizers, how do they do this? Through policies, through culture, through economy, where despite being independent on paper, many African governments are still dependent on their former colonizers. And I would like to hazard to say that when we look at these former colonizers, this also extends to other countries which were not necessarily colonizers, but however, um, let's say global powers, which also extend this particular hegemony. China and the US come to, to mind here. So Western aid, according to Nkrumah, was actually one of the tools which are used to coerce African elites particularly into acting in a certain way that is more beneficial for the former colonizers than for the African continent. And so what Nkrumah did or what he spoke about is he was warning about how this whole situation of, 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 um, of um, neocolonialism was actually particularly prevalent. And also he saw multinational corporations as being tools which would extend this hegemony. So now today when we talk about the digital sovereignty, it is essential that in this thinking, we also think about, organ about organizations such as um, the Gatham, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and uh, Microsoft, even though a couple of those have changed names. So quickly, I'll, um, when we talk about digital colonialism, basically we are talking about how the how colonialism has moved from being a physical colonialism, which we're all familiar with, which many African states um, shaked, shaked off the shackles of in the 60s, to what we have now where foreign powers, foreign entities, that is both state and private players, are actually exerting influence over African digital norms, digital rights, technology. So when we talk about digital colonialism, we then quickly have to talk about digital sovereignty. So sovereignty basically refers to how a state can have control over its own critical digital systems. And quickly, I'll mention that without really getting into the depth of this, digital sovereignty has many facets. For example, data sovereignty. Where is the data kept? Is the state in charge of the, of the, of the data generated from their territory? Is it, safe? is it kept there? Tech sovereignty, the tools that this particular state is using. Are they for the state? Are they made by that state? Please, when I say the state, I don't necessarily mean that the government is making them. But are they made in that particular country? And are they serving the interests of those people? When we talk of policy sovereignty, who is determining the policy that is directing the particular developments in a particular country? So basically, this is these are the this is what part of the framework that we are going to focus on. Uh, Dennis, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you. Um, and the last one is digital constitutionalism. We've heard a little bit about it. Uh, it's an ideology that translates core principles of contemporary constitutionalism in the context of digital society. This is from Celeste. Um, and it's, it, in contrast to traditional constitutionalism, it also focuses on um, multinational corporations, as Adiu just said, uh, so not just on nation states. Um, um, as it used to, and digital bills of rights uh, are these documents that come out, and it's kind of a, uh, a set of documents that came out to seek out to articulate a set of political rights, government principles, uh, norms and limitations, um, in order to, to drive forward this uh, movement of digital constitutionalism. I'll um, speed up a little bit, because in, in terms of time, um, there are um, at least five of these digital rights, of, uh, bills of rights, um, that have come out of um, pan-African or African national processes. There's a larger database of the Digital Constitutions Network, where this is from with 308 documents, uh, but those are um, uh, 
focus on, on Africa. Among them, the African Declaration of Internet Rights and Principles, and that's the one we're going to look at today. What we did is essentially a literature review of all the publicly available materials um, that we could find, and also in-depth interviews with, uh, so far, four members, uh, core members of the African Declaration um, Coalition, but we're in the process of actually finishing up some more um, interviews. Um, what did we find? So when was or why was this document created in the first place? One of the interviewees said um, that it was important to have African voices in the process and to actually lead a normative African um, uh, initiative when it comes to human rights protection online. Um, uh, one interviewee, Anriad Esterhausen, said uh, localizing uh, human rights pro uh, discussions for us was important and also to create a document to policymakers who increasingly uh, in the African continent uh, started to uh, make uh, legislation with regard to internet rights in that process that was 2013, 2014, uh, and then to guide them. Uh, and also to take an African uh, view. Um, the process essentially came up with a, um, with a document uh, published in 2014 at the IGF um, that has 13 principles, a preamble, uh, and it has a focus on affordability, access, uh, of, um, affordability of access, uh, and cultural and linguistic um, rights. Um, and it also has a strong call on various um, stakeholders what to actually do in order to implement those rights. Um, what were the impacts and the advocacy of the related to the document? Um, the coalition that formed when the document was drafted uh, was created with a secretariat, uh, and the coalition started using, doing advocacy both on local, national, and transnational um, African level. Um, significant uh, impacts uh, were a great influence on the 2019 revision uh, of the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access of Information in Africa. Uh, by the African Commission on Human Rights uh, and People's Rights um, in Banjul, which um, uh, is an important human rights uh, um, instru instrument or a court in, uh, in the African Union, uh, in Africa. Uh, citation um, also of the document by uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. These kind of things are successes and an influence on policy uh, in, on a nation state level. And that's the last two slides um, for Adio again. So. This particular um, proverb on, on appearing on your screen is one of my favorite ever African proverbs uh, from Nigeria. So it literally, until the lion has its own um, storytellers, the tale of the hunt will always glorify, glorify the hunter. So basically, when we talk about internet freedoms, internet rights, Nkrumah spoke about this idea of neocolonialism and about how Africans need to shake off the shackles of colonialism, not just the physical ones, but also in the internet. So basically the AFTEC um, was basically Africa writing its own story. So when we take when we talk about Pan-Africanism and AFTEC, we're here we are looking at a document that is written, as Dennis already explained, focusing on guiding principles for Africa by Africans. Because as we have noted many times, many African states still lag behind when it comes to the understanding that rights offline are also rights online. So issues like focusing on cultural and linguistic diversity are actually what makes this document particularly pan-African, given how Africa is not a country uh, and how Africa is a diverse place full of different languages and different cultural issues. So, however, the issue here, which um, Nkrumah perhaps would raise an eyebrow about, but I think maybe not, is that there have been the involvement of foreign entities. From our earlier, um, our, our earlier slides, we mentioned how Nkrumah identified Western aid as a tool for continuation of this hegemony. But however, Nkrumah was very clear that we, that he, we should not risk throwing away both the baby and the bathwater. So, what, does, what, did that, what did he mean? He meant that aid from foreign entities could actually be accepted as long as this particular aid came in the conditions or terms and conditions which were favorable for Africa. So in this case, assistance from these foreign entities can be viewed as assistance to further the goals of Africans by Africans for Africans. Thank you very much, Adio and Dennis, and uh, to keep on time and to share your, um, you, you had more, sorry. Um, if you, 
giving me 10 seconds, then I will choose it. Just some limitations of future research. I mean, we do acknowledge that, that uh, Kwame Nakuma also has other legacies, particularly in authoritarian um, a later um, style of government. So what? This is not necessarily in congruence with the ideas of human rights uh, online in Africa, just um, important limitation, obviously. But we really focused on the pan-Africanism uh, of Nkuma uh, here. And um, uh, some, some other things that we look into. We're still doing interviews. So this is a little bit of a work in, in progress. Thank you. And I might uh, get from your last line that uh, if you have more interviews, uh, suggestions, it's open uh, to, to receive them. So I, it's good uh, that, uh, to, to showcase here. But uh, thank you again, uh, Adio and, and Dennis, uh, for, uh, for your rich presentation and to share uh, your uh, early findings and, and, and the work in progress that you are developing. Um, about the flow of the session, so we have three articles, three papers that we are going to present. I'm going to give 10 minutes each. Uh, we just had one. Uh, just a few uh, teaser uh, provocative questions that, I, uh, that I'm going to, to throw to, to, uh, to the presenters and then um, I would like to take from the floor and from the, the, the presenters itself, because I think the papers are going to speak to each other. Uh, but the second one I'm going to call uh, to present is Professor Ian Art Schult. Um, the paper and the co-authors uh, the, 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 the co have presented is govern, gov governing the internet through self-based regional private regimes, uh, legitimacy at Afrinic, Apinic, and Lacnic. Uh, professor, if you want to take the floor. Okay, great. I need to screen share. Uh, Dennis, you, you apparently know how to do this. Do this yeah, yeah, I did yeah. that, but it's one participant share at a time. Um, okay, there we go. I only see myself. There we go, good, okay, good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much to Jamal and the rest of the organizing committee for putting this all together. Um, this paper is written by five of us, a team, uh, spread across the regions. Um, uh, Deborah Irene Christine in Indonesia, uh, Hortense Jonger in uh, the Netherlands, Naima Nascimento Faleros in uh, Brazil. Uh, Gloria Nzeka, DRC, and uh, currently at the University of Maryland, and myself. Uh, it's a project funded by the Swedish Research Council, for which uh, we're grateful for the funding. And we're actually doing something quite similar, I guess, in terms of regional, south-based uh, autonomy uh, direction in the global internet governance. Uh, in this case, looking at the three regional internet registries based in the global south. Um, so I'm going to say something about what the regional internet registries are, because have people heard of the regional internet registries in this audience? Some yeses, some noes, okay. Um, say a few things about them. Uh, same with the studies about why we're looking at the question of legitimacy and a little bit about the data collection. Um, these are the five regional internet registries. They are uh, based in North America, Aran, uh, Europe in the Middle East and Central Asia, RIPE NCC, uh, LACNIC in Latin America and the Caribbean, AFRINIC in Africa, and APINIC in the Asia Pacific region. And what's interesting here, as you notice, is that three of these bodies are in the global south. It's a regional approach to global internet governance, and it's based, it's non governmental and multi stakeholder. And that's quite a unique combination in internet governance, if you think about it. Um, and, and, the, and, and the RIRs actually make rules that matter. That's the other thing to say. There are, there are various other regional constructions of exchange point associations and CCTLD associations and the like, but in terms of significance for rules of the global internet, they are not, so, so they're, they're more trade associations. Uh, these people actually make, uh, make a number of rules. Uh, originally, the RIRs were two or three, um, and you see that uh, in Africa and Latin America, they came up. Uh, somewhat later, indeed, on the argument of uh, largely regional self-direction and self-determination. Um, the three south-based RIRs are the Asia-Pacific Network Information Center, 
uh, launched in 1993, has 7,800 members now spread across 56 territories. So, pretty big. The Latin America and Caribbean Network Information Center, LACNIC, is launched in 2002 and now has more than 12,000 network operators spread across 33 countries. So again, big. Uh, the African Network Information Center, AFRINIC, was launched in uh, 2005 and currently has 2,240 members. Um, and again, there's a question that comes out of all of this. So here we have South-based. Does that mean more autonomy in internet governance outside Europe and North America? And do we have here an important force for countering uh, digital divides? Briefly, for those of you on, who are not so acquainted with the RIRs, um, what do they do? Uh, they allocate the numbers, the addresses, on the global internet, the IP addresses and the autonomous uh, systems numbers, um, so that we have unique numerical identifiers for all devices connected to the internet uh, on one system. Without this one system of coordinated numbers, we wouldn't be talking with each other on the internet. There would be, there just wouldn't happen. Um, there's an important transition. Uh, it started with Internet Protocol version 4, um, IPv4. This was, this was the number version that was used uh, mostly initially. And, uh, but there's only 4.3 billion of these. Um, there are 5.4 regu 5 billion regular users of the internet now, so you can do the math and see we've got a problem. So IPv4 addresses have become, have become uh, insufficient, and the new version 6, IPv6, uh, with a larger capacity, so we have 340 trillion 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 IPv6 addresses, and we should have enough of those for a little time to come. Um, but the fact that IPv4 has run down so much means that in the last 10 years there's been a real scarcity issue and a secondary commercial market that has arisen there. And that re leads to all kinds of interesting scenarios that, for example, a uh, China-based company has set up a shell company in the Seychelles, has absorbed about 10% of the internet numbers uh, in Africa, and is selling them secondarily in other parts of the world uh, to, to, a, to a tune of millions and millions of US dollars, uh, which leads to various charges of digital colonialism and, 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 and the like. So it, uh, it gets, uh, it, so it, it's not just, there's a political economy behind all of this, which is, uh, which is quite intriguing. Um, you say it's only the numbers and registering the numbers. No, the RIRs actually do quite a bit more. They've trained tens of thousands of, uh, of internet engineers worldwide over the years. They've given grants for innovations, for, uh, for startups and the spread of the internet in less served areas. Uh, they measure internet use and performance. They've done all kinds of things on cybersecurity. Um, their 30 years of meetings have been very instrumental in building up the internet uh, community of, of regulators and managers. Um, and they've been a major place of building up multi-stakeholder governance processes in the internet. So if you put all of this together, uh, you kind of have to wonder, why haven't we had more research on the RIRs? Um, there's actually very little. Milton, in the back, you, you wrote a couple of uh, short pieces uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago. Um, there's been a couple of P PhD, two PhD theses, um, and a couple of short histories here or there. But otherwise, we don't actually have any anti-academic inquiry on the, on the regional internet registries, certainly not uh, the things that are comparable to the IETF or ICANN or other, other bodies. So there's a gap there. Um, and again, it's particularly intriguing because these, these bodies take a regional approach, they take a multi-stakeholder approach, they have a south based in, in three of the cases, and as I said, they're, they're important. So we are trying in this uh, study to look at on what basis uh, and how far these three south-based uh, internet registries are attracting legitimacy. So how far are people having approval, confidence, trust, belief, faith in these uh, alternative ways of organizing internet governance? Um, there's a larger body of literature coming up on legitimacy in multi-stakeholder global governance, so that feeds into that, uh, that literature. Um, but also there's this underlying thing. If we could show that indeed a lot of it legitimacy is attracted or not, and the bases on which this is done, then could a regional multi-stakeholder south-based approach to governing key global resources perhaps be transferred to other areas and be part of a more general south-based initiative on dealing with critical global resources. To that extent, one hopes there's some larger stakes involved in this work.
Um, just quickly here to look at the rise of multi-stakeholder global governance. Uh, Sometimes I don't think people necessarily get the, get the, the, the specifics of this rise as, as clearly as they might do. Uh, the dark line here in the middle are the numbers of intergovernmental, traditional intergovernmental treaty-based uh, organizations. And you see that basically they've plateaued since 1990. There, is, there isn't an increase in their numbers. Also, if you look at their resource, their material resources, and if you look at their institutional capacities to take decisions, those have also been, remained stable, if not declined in the last couple of decades. In contrast, you see the dotted line of multi-stakeholder global governance arrangements, and they've grown enormously and are now more than twice as numerous as the, uh, as the intergovernmental organizations, and indeed often have increasing resources and capacities at the time that multilateralism has stalled. So it's worth looking at this area of global governance. Um, again, we're looking at the legitimacy of the South-based uh, RIRs. That's to ask, you know, how far people believe and perceive that they have a right to govern and that they exercise that right to govern appropriately or properly. Um, if these organizations have that underlying approval, it gives them much more strength and stability and security. Uh, if they lack it, well then things are probably more fragile. Legitimacy, again, I, we, we look at it because, although it's not the only thing that makes governing tick, if you have legitimacy, you can expect to have a more secure mandate, you can expect to get more resources, you can expect to have more participation, you can be, expect to be able to take decisions better, you can expect to get more compliance, uh, thereby reach the goals that you have and, and probably advance uh, problem solving and hold yourself against competing institutions. Um, in a way, at the moment, we see AFRINIC, the African uh, Network Information Center, is having some considerable legitimacy challenges. Um, and if you look through this list, you can see they are struggling with their mandate, they're struggling to get resources, they're struggling to get people to participate. Well, actually, they're under an official receiver at the moment, and they can't even convene a meeting. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they've been unable to take decisions because they don't have a board. Um, compliance is, 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 is hard. Other people are also starting to say, we want to set up another organization. So you can see, without the legitimacy, an institution gets to be in, in trouble. Um, we have in interviews with, with people been asking them whether they think that legitimacy is important. Um, and then I guess it's reassuring to our research to find that 84% of the people say extremely important. Uh, and and uh, well, it says 86 here, it's actually dropped to 84 with the, la with the latest a couple of people who have had a few more doubts. But they're in the quite, quite important. Basically, almost everyone is saying that it's extremely or very important. Um, the research that we're doing, we're doing extensive interviews with, 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 with people, asking them about their levels of, uh, of confidence in these RIRs and looking at a number of ways in which uh, they, uh, a, a number of sources that might be driving their uh, legitimacy beliefs. We're asking them how much confidence they have in these organizations. We're also asking them how much they care about the organizations and how much they feel affected by the organizations. This is perhaps getting into little int intricacies of, uh, of legitimacy research but a lot of legitimacy research on, on, on uh, regional and global governance has only asked people how much confidence they have in the organizations. It hasn't asked how intensely they feel about the organizations. So you end up with these, with these results that say, oh, people's average legitimacy beliefs for, uh, I don't know, the United Nations is the same as their average legitimacy for their national government. But our hunch is that people probably care about and feel more affected by their national government than by the United Nations, so that you need to ask those additional questions. So we're doing that in this, in this research and, uh, and, and seeing what's going to come out of that. Uh, these are the interviews that we've done so far, 321. We were meaning to come here with, with more concrete results, but uh, it's really hard to do this research. I mean, to get, to get people to, 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 to sit down with you for 30, 40 minutes and do an extensive interview about, about the, all the different aspects and so on. In addition, the conditions in Afrinic at the moment, because of the fragility of the organization, a lot of people are understandably uh, a bit shy necessarily to, to, to come to, to, to... I mean, we do anonymous and confidential interviews, but nevertheless, a lot of people are quite exposed, and so you have to be very careful in, in research ethics terms, too, about how you do this. So I cannot say to you 
now. These are the results. Uh, I can say that we find variation in the in the in the in the levels of uh, of, 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 of confidence between the, these three RIRs, um, you can you can guess how that might be going. Um, we find variation between stakeholder groups. So, if, uh, depending on whether you're coming from a government or a civil society group or a business group or an academic, or a then you find our technical engineer. The, there tend to be differences amongst those groups in terms of how much legitimacy they give, um, and some social categories. So, differences by age, by by by, by gender, by language, and so on. Um, so that's, uh, and then we expect, again, can't go all the way here to say what the drivers are, but on the basis of other research and initial findings, we think we're going to find that institutional drivers, so people's perceptions of the purpose and procedure and performance of institutions, that those are the main things that drive these uh, confidence and legitimacy beliefs, though some other psychological and prevailing societal norm drivers probably figure as well. Um, Ask us again in a year. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor. You, you already advanced one of my questions regarding the drivers, so <laughs> I'm going to skip that off. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation, and we are going to have more time for questions in a moment. Um, then I would like to call the, the last paper uh, with Stephanie Arnold. She's going to be online. Stephanie Arnold? If yes, we can, can and can you see the screen? Yes, now we can uh, we can see you and 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 see the presentation. Also, Stephanie, welcome. Um, Stephanie is going to present uh, her paper about localizing digital policy making, the impact of the European Union digital for development policy in ICT policy adoption in the global south. Stephanie, welcome. You can take the floor. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good morning from Brussels and good afternoon to those who are in Kyoto. Um, my name is Stephanie Arnold. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Bologna and a PhD fellow at the United Nations University Chris in Belgium. So um, I will talk a little bit about um, the EU's effect um, on uh, digital policy making globally and especially um, in Africa. And I try to do so a little bit through the lens of digital sovereignty and digital colonialism. And here I would like to thank my co-panelists for giving such uh, a brilliant introduction to those two uh, concepts. And I hope that my presentation will complement um, a little bit what they already said. So let me see if I can move the slides. Yes, so um, we know that there is no uh, very clear concept about um, digital sovereignty, um, but um, the understanding of what digital sovereignty means varies across regions. Now, I'm going to focus uh, on the European Union, and I would argue that um, in the European Union, we noticed that the uh, European Union as such, but also the member states um, argue for more state sovereignty over the digital space. And this is especially to counterbalance the um, increasing power of big technology companies, especially from uh, China and the United States. So to this end, um, over the past few years, the European Union has adopted a series of digital policies, most famously probably the General Data Protection Regulation, so the GDPR, um, and more recently than the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, the AI Act, and so on. And the objective was basically to protect individual rights um, in the digital space and, yes, to um, protect, uh, uh, to extend the, this to, to the digital sphere. So um, we also heard about the Brussels effect um, and basically the Brussels effect, through the Brussels effect, these digital policies have reached a global um, influence um, in a way and set the benchmark for um, individual rights in the digital space. However, what I'm going to argue is that um, it is not only through the Brussels effect that the EU digital policies have a global reach, but actually the EU has also devised um, some tools that facilitate the spread um, of the, let's call it European governance model um, to other regions, in particular in the global south. And here in particular, I have looked at the European development policies, so the digital for development policy, and then more recently, the global gateway and the digital for development hub that has been set up within the global gateway. And 
if we look at this, let's take the digital for development policy for a second, which um, is already a little bit older. It dates back to 2016. Um, we noticed that um, the digital for development policy aims to promote access to digital infrastructure, li literacy and skills, digital entrepreneurship, digital technologies for sustainable development and so on. But at the time, and this has now actually changed with the global gateway, at the time there was no dedicated funding for this. So the idea was really to mainstream digital technologies in development policy um, more in general. And I think we've uh, heard um, in uh, our first contribution that th there was European funding to civil society organizations to promote, um, yes, uh, uh, digital um, uh, uh, human rights. So um, this could, could have been like one of the ways um, how, how it worked. So through, through the support of other um, uh, yes, uh, organizations. Now, what we notice when we look at, at this digital for development policy is that there's a strong focus on Africa. So this slide shows um, the D4D mentioned. So how often a certain a geographic region is mentioned in the D4D policy. And as you can see, Africa, um, so it's the orange bars, Africa outnumbers um, all the other regions. Um, in fact, Latin America and the Caribbean, for instance, are mentioned like four or five times compared to Africa that is mentioned over 70% the times and this does not met, uh, match the uh, development flow the, the development fund flows um, because as we can see here the EU development fund flows mainly go to Asia and the European uh, neighborhood policy countries um, which is the bar on the very right um, and then we still have the official development aid by member states the um, purple uh, uh, bars and those go um, yes mainly to Africa but still um, yes it, it's uh, not necessarily the majority of funds that have gone to, to Africa in this in this sense well if we take uh, the stance from Africa what we need to bear in mind is that um, most African countries they depend on foreign technology and foreign finance uh, for their digital development. At the same time, um, we have a rather fragmented cyber governance. Even though there have been various initiatives, um, especially also on, on the pan-African level, so through the African Union, for instance, um, there has the implementation of national governments um, had, at the national level um, has been rather. Yes, um, let's say hesitant. Um, for instance, if we take the Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, there is only one country, namely Rwanda, that has ratified it so far. Um, now, these, these two uh, factors together make African states quite vulnerable to digital colonialism um, by big technology companies to extract data, for instance. And I would argue one of the main ways to avert this are digital policies at the national level. And this is why I looked at what um, affects digital policy adoption at the national level. Um, the research questions in this regard were, does the geographical focus of the D4D policy affect the ICT policy adoption in African countries and therefore make them more resilient against digital colonialism? And to what extent does, the, does Chinese influence through the Belt and Road Initiative enhance or mitigate the EU's effects on ICT policy adoption? So what I did is a multivariate regression analysis. Um, the outcome variable was the uh, was taken um, by the ICT regulatory tracker score. So um, that's uh, sort of an index compiled every year by the International Telecommunication Union, um, which looks at different um, yeah variables. Um, and I looked at the a change of the score from 2013 to 2018 um, to see okay have there been improvements in the ICT policies or have there actually been um, yes, uh, uh, declines. So um, the explanatory variables to see whether there is a different effect on Africa compared to other regions are on the one hand the ITU macro regions, but I, uh, to double check and to um, make a robustness test I also used the UN uh, statistical division geo scheme and then I checked whether there is a difference with um, BRI membership and then I had some control variables um, of uh, yeah, economic relevance. Um, just briefly, this is what I found. So if we take Africa as a benchmark um, up there um, with, with a zero, so um, compared, to, um, compared to Africa, so uh, 
being located in, let's say, the Arab states, uh, being one of the Arab states, um, would yield a much uh, lower percentage of um, ICT policy adoption compared to Africa. And the same goes for East Asia and Pacific and the former Soviet space. Um, and um, arguably, this 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 could be, and here I'm still conducting analysis. Um, this could be exactly because Africa has this um, additional influence, this additional attention, um, for instance, um, by the European Union through the Digital for Development policy that encourages digital policy making. But now let's see what happens um, if we scrutinize for um, uh, membership in the Belt and Road Initiative. And what we notice is that if we only look at um, BRI members, um, regions uh, outside Africa, so the East Asia and Pacific, as well as um, uh, Central Asia, I mean, essentially, um, they perform much better than African countries. But if we look at non-BRI membership, we have exactly the opposite, um, the opposite trend. Um, again, I'm still looking into this, why this is, but I think an early explanation could be that um, areas that um, receive uh, less attention from the EU, they rely very much um, on initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative to promote the digitalization at home. And with more digitalization, of course, also comes the need for more regulation. Um, in Africa, Africa might be more immune to this influence exactly because they have um, yeah, various alternatives, multiple influences from, um, from abroad. Um, so the main takeaways, the geographic focus of the D4D policy does make a positive difference in Africa, at least, um, and the BRI membership boosts ICT policy adoption where interest, EU interest for digitalization is, is low. That's from my side. Thank you so much for your attention and I really look forward to your questions and suggestions. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for joining us. Uh, and uh, there are some applause from, from the room for the three of you. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much again. Um, I'm glad I alert you that I was sleep deprived because in the beginning, I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is uh, Raquel Gatto, and I joined GigaNet uh, many years ago, 2007. I was in your shoes presenting my paper at the time, and I, Jeff Rio. Um, and my, my master and my PhD uh, is about the internet governance and the sovereignty principle. Uh, we were just a few of the researchers and the sources that I could grasp at the time, and I'm so glad it has expanded, and now we have more people to dialogue with about it. Um, and so uh, let me start just some teaser questions, and then I'm going to invite uh, uh, the audience to, to come to the microphone and also make their questions. Uh, just a few reactions first uh, on, on uh, Dennis and, and I, Adio, I think he's still with us. Sorry, Adio, I can't see you, but uh, um, just to, to mention, uh, first, um, it, you've also used uh, Marcos' view of internet, the Brazilian view of rights as one of the experiences and that I can speak uh, closer uh, from, from my experience. Um, and in fact, uh, Marcos' view uh, fits into this principle-based uh, legislation, right? There is uh, happening into the digital colonialism idea. Uh, but then uh, it was not only about shaping uh, a good policy, let's put that way, but it's also about how it is implemented and then follow up. Right, and I think uh, in in your paper and the presentation, it's pretty clear also this uh, the two dimensions between the process of shaping the the policy, right, and then uh, the implementation and follow up and the impact, whatever <laughs> you can measure of this impact, uh, that is uh, really important. And what uh, it strikes me as a curiosity, if you are going to expand or have, uh, you know a little bit more on these uh, two dimensions. And then uh, what can be more intention-based uh, and more replicable also uh, to, you know, to others, uh, other countries and other regions uh, to draw from? And what I mean by that is usually, uh, for example, even the African Declaration, it's been uh, kind of triggered by a necessity and not necessarily an intention that, you know, a process that you start and build and, and, uh, and a continuous process. And, and, um, and also if there are takeaways that you can replicate that uh, in, in, in other places. So is that clear? Okay. And then <laughs> for uh, Professor Ian and then um, 
some of the, I mean, there was a lot here to, to take on. Uh, I'm trying to keep to two. But uh, I don't say in the coffee if I'm going to make more. <laughs> uh, but I think the first one uh, that I want to, to, to react uh, in regards also to the IPv4 and IPv6 policies, uh, not to go to the nitty grits of the African um, um, situation, but then um, uh, also if you were considering uh, comparison with the North-based uh, 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 IRR, so RN and, and the RIPE, right? Because um, I, I can see some of the differences, for example, now from my side of the world, LACNIC, and then RN, uh, how they're also uh, taking different policies in regards to the IPv6 uh, leftover market. And so this is very interesting also to, to compare uh, how the, those regional policies are really happening and, and what is the impact, right? Um, and, 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 and these approaches that are different uh, from, from the South. And my second question, I'm probably going to um, put together two of them and try to explain why. Um, but what I find interesting also uh, in terms of the background uh, in, in this paper is uh, that it puts the IRRs beyond their tech mandate, right? Their, their technical mandate. And um, because one thing uh, on, on, on the technical community and it's pretty straightforward is uh, the internet needs to function and we need to have the addresses and we need to have, you know, the, the, po the technical policies for it. But then there is this discussion about the role of this technical community also in the, the gray area of policies uh, and political policies, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be redundant here. Um, and then uh, I, I think it's, it's where you were going, but I want to check if that's, uh, you know, um, the, the consideration in the overall research that you were um, you were taking, uh, but also in terms of the context you were mentioning, uh, and and how the the, the these technical based uh, organizations are uh, understood in in the 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 the, the broader community, the perception that they are only technical communities, or if they are you know, beyond this mandate. And, and I'm saying that because I see also from, from experience that uh, there is this kind of bundle tech lash <laughs> that the IRRs, the, uh, the CCTLDs, and all those technical organizations are uh, considered part of these digital platforms, and then they are considered part of, you know, um, just a mushy, mushy, uh, place. Anyway, so that's uh, kind of my very broad but uh, uh, curiosity in, in your paper. And then uh, Stephanie, uh, sorry, I, I, I don't, ah, now I see you, <laughs> so I can, uh, I can also address to you in the, the prompter here. But um, so uh, some of the questions that I had in regards to, to your presentation and your paper, um, it's a very elementary one, but let me explain why. <laughs> uh, my question is, what is considered digital policy? So um, I, I was also curious on uh, one basic difference, right? Uh, in particular, when we we're thinking about the different law regimes, if you we are talking about common law and civil law, and not necessarily everything is kind of uh, mapped as a digital policy. Uh, uh, in a narrow way, in, a, in the narrow concept. And I'm, I'm not sure um, if you are considering some sort of uh, classification uh, on, on this front, but if you are, I would uh, love to hear. And then uh, my second question in, is regards the difference between quantity and quality. So uh, one of the streams, and, and that's very interesting, that you are trying to bring the, the numbers, right? Uh, Evidence-based uh, research and and uh, those are very interesting uh, findings that that you brought. Uh, but then I, I, I kept the questions uh, if you are also considering um, an evolution of the the, the research uh, to also consider the the, the quality. Uh, you were mentioning uh, the positive effects. Uh, I think by the end uh, of those policies to be geo based, but also if they are. Uh, in terms of the content itself, um, if there is going to be any any 
um, any evaluation. So I think those are the, the teaser questions. Um, I don't know if you want to start in the reverse order, uh, just to hear and then invite the public. Stephanie, can I start with you? Okay. Yes, well, uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, very, very interesting uh, questions um, that I have not very much reflected upon yet, but um, I will, I will um, try to see. So um, with regards to digital policies and the ICT policies, in fact, I do believe there's a discrepancy. Um, and especially also based on what we've just heard, I think we also need to distinguish between, for instance, the um, ICT a regulatory tracker score also takes into account, for instance, um, the competition environment um, in the online space, right? Um, and I think that is very much different from, example, for example, the freedom of expression. So I do think... Um, in going forward, I will need to introduce um, a classification or at least a specification of what exactly um, I, I, I mean. And I think that um, is closely um, related also to what you said that, well, not all laws that touch the digital space are explicitly digital policies. Um, so um, and I, I think that that goes hand in hand. And then this would mean to actually look at the content, uh, the quality of those policies, not only uh, the quantity. I think that's a very, very valuable um, comment, um, one that I will need um, to uh, address um, in going forward. Um, so far, the limitation that I had, and this is still a project um, at, the, let's say, the earlier stage of research, the limitation I had so far is that I cannot really consider all the digital policies of all the developing countries um, in the in the um, global south. So that was one of the main reasons why I limited the analysis to the quantitative um, and just um, relied on the, the tracker score. But now that I know that, for instance, African countries tend to perform better when it comes to um, policy adoption, even when taking into account development level um, uh, yeah, uh, and so on, um, I think I can maybe limit myself um, to to that uh, region and then look at the content. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Professor Yun. Oh, I had a 50% chance, good. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Raquel. The, the, the issue about we limited ourselves to the three south-based RIRs. Yes, ideally one would have looked at all five. We've chosen a method of deep qualitative mixed methods research, face-to-face uh, -face in the meetings, but very often the resources needed for all that are just very high and we and we want to, to also do large numbers of interviews. Um, I won't tell you what the research, I mean the research budget just to do the work that we are doing is already very high, so we chose to prioritize the south-based. Um, uh, and that was uh, that, that. Of course, has certain limitations at some point. On IPv6, I was trying to chase up the, uh, the 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 data here, but I believe it's right that in fact LACNIC leads the way on IPv6 uh, as a proportion of, and I don't think they're even working with IPv4 uh, allocations, new allocations at all. Um, and that gives them a great advantage to some extent. Uh, if Afrinic, for example, had done the same and thrown itself. It, deep into the IPv6, then a lot of the problems that they, that they have at the moment would uh, certainly recede, if not disappear. So LACNIC has made a strategic choice to go for, for IPv6 in a, in a big way, and that seems in their political economy to be working in their favor. Um, the, the, you know, yeah, the RIRs are, 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 are described as, as being technical and technical mandate. Once you look at the wider issue, though, then you realize, as ever, nothing is ever purely technical. Um, it's political, it's economic, it's ecological, it's uh, cultural. Um, and one sees that in these, uh, in these, in these, these organizations. So uh, what kind of knowledge are they producing and for whom? There, there are deep cultural, political questions that come up here. Um, deep economic issues, IPv6 is core to the development of Internet of Things, uh, smart cities, smart homes, so-called Industry 4.0. Uh, huge economic interests in, in, in involved in this. So it, the, the narrow technical business and then questions of power. Who's making these decisions for whom? Uh, who gets the voice? who doesn't, is it a multi-stakeholder process, is it a multilateral process, they're, they're, they're deep, deep, deep political questions. So, of course, that makes it much more interesting. Yeah. 
Uh, the, I mean, the technical circles in the RIRs would like to say, oh, we're only technical, leave us alone. Uh, but they're much more than technical, so we don't leave them alone. The train has passed. <laughs> And I'm trying to answer your two questions, uh, essentially. So you brought up the, um, the national, uh, Marcus Seville, a national document also uh, entailed in this larger database uh, that we have on digital bills of rights. Uh, it is part of the, I think, in that sense, part of the conversation, but in, in the sense of looking from this um, uh, analysis that we do, uh, it is a national document and it's very different from this pan-Africanism that we wanted to look at. Um, when we look at um, African documents, we have the Nigerian um, Digital Rights and Freedom Bill um, that was never actually signed by the president, but that would, would have been rather an example that would be comparative to kind of see and then also how do you amend legislation, how do you actually implement legislation afterward. This in, in effect is an advocacy doc document. It has a very different um, uh, role to play in that sense. But it brings up the question that um, Stephanie also um, said National um, legislation in Africa is the solution. I mean, we have to look at like where is this actually happening or not. Um, and from that kind of promoting um, African uh, Union or Pan-Africanism, uh, may, maybe not. Maybe you should actually solve the problems uh, across the continent in a way. I think that's, that's the thing that um, those who, who wrote the African Declaration uh, had in mind. Uh, and I think the second part is, um, Oh yeah, um, uh, how intentional is this when you start drafting a document, um, you do you know where this is actually going? And I think um, there are two kind of things that happen at the same time. I've studied many of those documents, uh, not just this case. Um, um, people have a clear idea what they want to do, what they want to achieve, how and why they write the document, but things then change and so they have to change their plans. But at the same time, um, these coalitions often do many things at the same time, trying to uh, involve uh, policymakers on the local, national, regional level at the same time. And so you, you almost have this effect of um, throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks, right? Because you, 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 you target many different levels. Um, and yeah, people still have an idea and a hope for how things will be adopted. Usually um, people believe that it would be great if this would be law or if this would be a treaty. That's often the, the, the main focus uh, of these documents. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, and thank you very much for uh, further consideration and clarifications. Uh, now, we already have people in the queue. Milton, you want to take uh, the floor? And then if anyone else from the audience wants to make questions, please, uh, there are microphones in both aisles. Yeah, I'm, I have a comment on one paper, and, and a big question about us. another one. Is that OK? We have time for it? Sorry? Do we have time for it? We do. Okay. So, so the comment is about the IP address registries. Uh, I think, um, uh, Jan, you totally understated the amount of literature that already exists on this. There's, there's a lot of literature about IP address scarcity and about IP address markets. We've published two papers about that. Uh, and uh, there's a detailed paper, not a short paper, as you said, about the application of uh, Ostrom's uh, theories of self-governance to the, to the IP address space, looking at uh, IP addresses as a, as a uh, common pool resource. Um, and uh, another thing is that you, you indicated that if Africa had gone into IPv6, that it wouldn't have had these problems, and I think that's just completely wrong. Um, number one, IPv6 is not being adopted because it's not compatible, and in order to upgrade to it, you have to spend a lot of money. So of course, Africa is lagging behind because it doesn't have the, the financial resources to suddenly convert all of their networks into an incompatible protocol uh, and keep running the old protocol at the same time. Anyway, uh, we can talk about that more, uh, Jan. But um, I really wanted to add, talk about digital colonialism. I think this, this thing is thrown around. People sound very progressive. They're, they're you know, against digital colonialism. Um, I don't know what it is, because I see, uh, in the one hand, people implying that if people in Africa use Google, uh, they're being colonized. Um, and I think this is kind of a weird notion. Uh, when I think of colonialism, particularly European colonialism in Africa, I think of uh, troops marching in and uh, occupying territories, uh, about killing people and about establishing governmental structures, not about market transactions between end users and some uh, foreign company. 
So uh, can we get a better notion of what exactly we're talking about with digital colonialism? Uh, what kind of a power relationship are we talking about? How do you distinguish between market relations and political relations? And I realize they're related, of course, I'm a political economist, but, but uh, can we have a sharper distinction between when people are just engaged in market transactions with foreigners and when they are being oppressed and dominated by foreigners? And, and one other element of that is like the, the paper about Europe sort of implied that if Europe runs these development programs for Africa, that's protecting them against colonialism. But if China uh, provides this kind of development aid, that's colonialism. So it's like, what's the difference? Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question, very short one, and then uh, I go for, the, yeah. Yeah. You can take the mic. So it's... Um can you introduce yourself? Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm Andrea Galderaro. I was the discussant that uh, came later. <laughs> <laughs> so now I feel, I feel the pressure that I have to say something. No, but uh, I'm Andrea Galderaro from Cardiff University and also European University Institute. Um, quick reactions to Milton's comment. For me, digital colonialism is when we uh, are uh, somebody sets some standards and there is no capacity for the rest of the world to engage in uh, negotiating these standards somehow. This is at least my own interpretation about digital colonialism. And actually, it's very much linked to the, to the conversation we are having here today. And uh, is uh, maybe a question to Jan Art and Dennis, um, especially in, uh, for Jan Art, uh, is whether, how do you see these negotiations happening at the regional uh, registry level, um, coordinated or complementary to other conversations, uh, forms of international cooperation that are happening in other uh, fora, uh, uh, negotiating uh, totally different stuff, let's say, like uh, discussion about cyber security, the ongoing discussion about cyber diplomacy, where there is uh, lots of inequalities there also uh, in, uh, in, uh, from the Global South in engaging in, this, uh, in, the, in these uh, other uh, processes. Thank you very much, Andre. And I was almost myself answering a little bit on the Milton, but we can do that over coffee. Uh, so now I'm going to take uh, then uh, uh, um, perhaps Professor Ian first, and then uh, Dennis and Stephanie, uh, who is online. Uh, and I'm going to ask you just very short reactions, two, three minutes, and then we can continue uh, offline. Thank you. Yeah, no, I got it. Um, uh, thanks. I, I do want to recognize uh, my colleagues Deborah and Hortense who are online. So if they want to, pri if they want to, if they want to jump in uh, on any of this, they, they should do. Milton on the literature. Thank you. And let's 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 talk and let me get the. I'm 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 wondering whether this literature is on governance, though. So how much it's on governance, by, as opposed to technical, more technical aspects and economics and so on. But let's let's see. My 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 comment was related to the governance literature, and my sense is that that's that that's quite limited. Um, and of course, what you say about IPv6 and the, and the technical complications of adopting it is, is, is of course, true. Uh, I, I was kind of saying a what-if kind of comment rather than uh, uh, meaning to imply that it could be done so quickly. The bigger question that you raised on digital colonialism, I mean, I think um, there's a lot to be said about all of this. Um, but, you know, the, the, just give two, 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 two examples, maybe that illustrates a little bit. When ICANN uh, sets up its sale of GTLDs and says you have to pay 185,000, this is back in 2012, you have to pay 185,000 US dollars to only to apply, and it takes over a million US dollars to get to the end of the process and you set up insurance policies which are not available easily outside of Europe and, and North America, uh, then surprise, surprise, you get less than 10 GTLDs in Africa. That's more than market forces. That's power relationships as well. Um, or when I attended the AFPIF meeting recently, um, one of the... Uh, people from a cable laying company uh, got up and gave an account of how by laying the cables, uh, they were opening up Africa as Stanley and Livingston had done a, a century before and seemed not to 
feel any discomfort in, in discussing the situation in those terms. I just give a few anecdotes to say that I think there are moments when people think, yeah, there's something not quite right going on here. Thank, thank you, Ian. And I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge uh, Deborah uh, Ortens and others who are online. If you want to uh, take the floor, pl please open the mic and, and say it. I'm not looking Zoom right now. Uh, but then I'm, I'm following with Dennis, and we can come back if anyone wants to take the floor uh, who is online. OK. Oh, Adio, sorry. Adio uh, is going to take the question. Um, thank you very much uh, to the colleague and the audience. I didn't get his name um, for that question. Um, I, of course, uh, and also thanks to other colleagues who have already, um, Stephanie and Jan, who have already sort of answered this issue on digital colonialism. I would like to fundamentally differ with um, the colleague and the audience, particularly when he mentions that. Um, when he mentions that um, this issue of digital colonialism, that uh, it's just market forces. I feel like that is an oversimplification of a very complex um, issue. Because when you talk about digital colonialism, what we basically are talking about is issues of power. So he, he, he juxtaposed this with um, troops marching in and chains and everything. At the base of that, what is at the base of that? That's power. So what we're talking about is when we say digital colonialism, we are simply speaking about the power of foreign owned platforms in determining policies and the rules of the game in Africa. For example, Facebook. When you talk of Facebook, when you talk of TikTok, I think really, to really put this into context, we have seen how Facebook, TikTok, and all these other major platforms have gotten in trouble with the GDPR, for example, or with the US being summoned to, to Congress. Why is this happening? Because these are issues of power. So. What then happens with these particular platforms is when they come to Africa and convert Africa as a site of data extraction with the data from Africans being merely harvested and, and saved and utilized outside of the continent without prior regards to the needs as well as the, the rights and determinations of the Africans. So also in my definition of um, digital sovereignty, and which also touches into colonialism. I spoke about the issue of um, tech sovereignty and police sovereignty. So who is developing these tools that are being used in Africa and who are they surfacing? Can I get tools which can allow me to communicate in Tigrinya or in Shon or in African language? No. But however, at the end of the day is that the Africans are forced to utilize these tools in a particular language, in a particular cultural and economic context. And that is what we mean when we speak of digital colonialism. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry, Adio. No, uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Adio. And uh, um, it was Milton Miller who made the question. He is a very known scholar and one of the founders of GigaNet. Uh, and very known to touch some open wounds, which is good. We, we, we need to, <laughs> to discuss uh, this uh, uh, openly. And so last, uh, Stephanie, uh, do you want to take the floor? Uh, and I'm sorry to push you for uh, two minutes. We need to close and go for the next panel. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. So maybe I will just limit myself. Um, to address the comment on, on uh, my contribution. So I did not mean to say that um, the EU is uh, some, let's say, the good Samaritan that comes in uh, and saves Africa from digital colonialism. And neither did I mean to say that um, China is the evil player that comes in and colonizes Africa, not at all. What I, what I meant to say is that digital policies um, are one of the ways that can help avert um, digital colonialism. And um, what I found in my in my analysis is that um, the EU, um, through, for instance, the Digital for Development Policy, encourages digital policy adoption. Now, um, as I also specified in in my previous comment, of course, um, we would now need to to look at the specifics of the of the content of the digital policies. Um, 
But um, just, just to add to this, the European Union does not pursue this way because, um, yes, they, uh, they are, again, the good Samaritan, but I think it's rather because they do not have such a powerful position in terms of big technology companies. Um, those are mainly located in the US and China. And with their own digital policies, I think they try to curtail um, the power of those companies. Um, and by contrast, um, China, for instance, they have less of a focus on on um, on, on regulation, on digital policies, um, which does not mean that they automatically like colonize others, not at all. In fact, the other uh, findings that I found is that um, where we look at BRI membership, so Belt and Road um, Initiative membership, um, we actually have more um, policy adoption compared to non-BRI members. Um, except that in in my in my um yeah in my opinion this is not because um in, in my opinion this is because the digitalization um uh, requires more regulation and the bri membership enables more digitalization so i hope uh yeah this was somewhat clear thank you thank you very much stephanie and thank you very much everyone uh who joined us in, in the panel and the audience and now let's go for the next panel uh, with our colleague uh, Luis Barbosa. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon. I, I think you're looking forward for a break, but I promise you that the panel will be worthwhile to, to assist. So welcome to the fifth panel. Uh, my name is Luis Barbosa. I come from the United Nations University Unit on Digital Governance, uh, located in Portugal. And it's my pleasure to introduce these three papers on somehow related or unrelated topics. We'll discuss digital sovereignty, um, ways of pressuring governments, uh, and, and um, youth participation. This, uh, Three different topics will, will make sense together, I, I do think. So we'll start right immediately with the first speaker, which is Nicola Palladino from Trinity College, Dublin. I think, Nicola, you are online. Can you confirm? Yes, I'm online. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. So you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you. OK, OK. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to have my presentation by remote. I'm very sad to not be there with you. Uh, but uh, I hope we can have anyway uh, a fruitful uh, discussion on this topic. Uh, well, without losing time, I'm going to uh, share my presentation with you. OK. Oh, uh, well, um, in this presentation, uh, I will argue how in the digital world, states uh, translate the concept of sovereignty, but in practice of territorialization of the cyberspace and uh, in extraterritorial projection of power, and uh, I will also point out how digital sovereignty is a double-edged sword that could serve to realize both form of digital constitutionalism and digital authoritarianism. And I will also illustrate how states and because digital sovereign practices give rise to conflicts and legal uncertainty, which impede uh, cooperation and undermine global effort to guarantee fundamental rights in the digital environment. Uh, well, I want to apologize in advance because to stay in the two minutes limit of this presentation can just provide a spotlight for each of these points. But if there is uh, some topic you would uh, like to deepen, I will be very happy to discuss them during the question time. Uh, well, let's start saying that digital sovereignty has become a, a popular concept in international relations and beyond. And as we delve into the process of digitalization of our society and we become more and more aware about the challenges and threats that it poses, an increasing number of subjects vindicate greater control on data and digital technologies. And well, when we come to state digital sovereignty, we can see that it seems to combine two apparently competing conceptualization sovereignty. 
On the one hand, we have a conception based on the classical notion of sovereignty as the exercise of supreme political authority on a territory, which focuses on the capability by states to control data flow, digital infrastructures, and uh, operators within their boundaries. But on the other hand, we have a, a heterodox conception that disentangles sovereignty from territory and shifts the focus on concepts such as autonomy, self-determination, resilience, Oh, uh, well, this confusion between these two different conceptions, sovereignty, is well illustrated by the concept of digital strategic autonomy that, according to Tim Merz, could be considered as the uh, operationalization of states' digital sovereignty and consists of the ability to decide and act autonomously on the essential digital aspect of a country long term futures in terms of security, economy, and institution. Uh, well, given that today, digital, the digital world is still composed for the vast majority of transborder processes and flows, the underlying assumption in the concept of digital strategic autonomy is that to exercise digital sovereignty, states must not only control the digital activities on their territory, but also try to influence processes and subjects that are beyond its borders. And so digital sovereignty is then operationalized through two complementary processes. On the one hand, we have the territorialization cyberspace, and on the other hand, we have the extraterritorial projection of power in the digital world. Uh, well, the territorialization of cyberspace consists of the process of bringing back aspects of the digital world into configuration of authority and power linked to territorial space. Uh, on a more practical level, among other things, it may consist of the control of the internet traffic, meaning that states may impose uh, uh, internet service providers to block or filter the access to determinate IP addresses, the nationalization of internet operator by requiring that they have legal representative on country territory, promoting domestic champions or rising market barrier to foreign companies, uh, data localization practice, requiring provider to store and process data uh, within the borders of the country in which the data have been generated or collected, and uh, by implementing also mandatory risk and security assessment to ensure that ICT system and infrastructure meet certain security standards that are aligned with the uh, national interest of a country. Uh, while on the other side, the extraterritorial extension of digital sovereignty may occur in different way. The first one is by resorting to well-recognized international law principles, such as the active nationality principle, the passive nationality principle, the effects doctrine, or the protective principle. And the main point here is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. States already have legal basis for their extraterritorial claims of sovereignty, but it also means that the potential conflict that may arise may be solved within the uh, framework of international law. Uh, well, then the uh, extraterritorial expansion of digital sovereignty may be realized through the regulation and standardization of technologies. Uh, in this case, if a state is successful in imposing the rules and standards through which a technology is developed, deployed, or used beyond uh, this border, it could embed its own value and principle within the socio technical architecture of such technology. And so it could also define the related possibility and constraint. Well, a third way uh, is uh, by using national tech company as a proxy of power. And in so doing, states can extend their digital sovereignty using the transnational technological infrastructure of tech company to pursue their goals. Well, so we observed how digital sovereignty refers to both policies of territorialization subspace and extraterritorial extension sovereignty. Now I would like to point out how digital sovereignty could be considered as double-edged sword, meaning that it both enable uh, people protection and control. Uh, the control of digital infrastructure data flow is crucial to safeguard fundamental rights and ensure the rule of law, but the same practice uh, at the same time can more likely lead to mass surveillance censorship policies and can be used to perform an undue interference uh, on other state that can do or to conduct uh, cyber warfare operation. And in short, an effective digital sovereignty could be considered as a necessary, even not sufficient condition to realize digital constitutionalism, but it could also easily reverse into digital authoritarian practices. 
Uh, in the last part of my presentation, I would like to show uh, our state's resource strategically to different digital sovereignty conception practice. And to this purpose, I focused on the data sovereignty uh, related policies of China, US and uh, European Union. Uh, well, we can see that in all the considered cases, states put in place both territorialization of the cyberspace and extraterritorial projection of power practices. In particular, all of them uh, reach some form of data localization, even if through different means. Uh, Chinese are resorted to legal obligation. In the case of the European Union, uh, this is a second, more a secondary effect of privacy requirement for data transfer that make for companies more convenient to store EU data locally. And in the case of US, data localization did uh, not require any particular legislative intervention, but is due uh, to the fact that, of course, the largest internet companies are already based in the United States. Uh, while also the ban of uh, foreign technologies and um, security assessment of foreign hardware and software are common practice in all uh, the three cases considered. Uh, moving on the extraterritorial expansion and sovereignty, we can note that both the uh, United States, European Union and China uh, will vindicate digital sovereignty in their own territories, but at the same time, they advance explicit extraterritorial claims based on one of the international law principles uh, we mentioned before, for example, in the Article 3 of the GDPR, on the Article 10 of the Chinese National Intelligence Law, or in the US Cloud Act. Um, instead, one of the most relevant differences between the three cases is that the US and China leverage on their digital champions as a proxy to fulfill both domestic and uh, extraterritorial enforcement, intelligence and security operation, while the European Union tend to exploit more its regulatory power. And uh, overall speaking, we can say that the EU is closer to the digital constitutions model in which uh, digital sovereignty practices are mostly used to safeguard the safety the, the safety and the privacy of uh, its citizens, while the uh, US and China in different ways use their power to conduct a surveillance intelligence operation. Uh, well, so in the current landscape, we have overlapping digital sovereignty claims that feed geopolitical conflict and tension. Uh, some examples of that are the competing claims uh, on tech companies to store locally on transfer abroad uh, data stemming from the GDPR, the Cloud Act, and the Chinese National Intelligence Act. Another example could be the ban war between the US and China. Um, and furthermore, this ambiguous strategy strategic use of digital sovereignty by states by jeopardize fundamental rights protection in the digital ecosystem uh, posing uh, at least two main risks. A first risk concerns the weaponization of privacy and data protection. This is particularly evident in the case of Chinese, the Chinese personal information protection law. This law is indeed a series of very advanced privacy and data protection principles, very similar to GD, GDPR, but uh, they are mostly used to constrain the operation of domestic and foreign tech companies to prevent uh, data transmission abroad, rather than to safeguard Chinese people, right? Um, the second risk concern grounding the safeguard of fundamental right on power relation and power sources. And as we know, the European Union is supposed to accept a kind of extraterritorial power to the so-called Brussels FED, which consists uh, in the capability to leverage and combine a series of key factors such as the value of internal market and regulatory and administrative capacity to force foreign country to adopt its global standard. But this is a risk that at the international level, it will replace international law with power and power resources are unstable terrain on which to ground human rights protection. Nothing prevents that in the next future the Brexit effect could be replaced by a Beijing effect and that tech company will force it to uh, adapt to Chinese rules and standards as it is already happening to some extent. Uh, well, to conclude very shortly, I think that the best way for states to solidify digital sovereignty without escalating geopolitical tension and jeopardize international human rights law could be to use this sovereignty to engage in the international cooperation to reach international agreement, setting back rules to solve disputes and regulate and functioning of the digital technologies. I know that uh, it might sound utopistic, but um, 
some example as the discussion that we have on the digital at uh, the global digital compact or about uh, the council of europe convention 108 uh, could be a good example uh, uh, you know, for this way to move forward uh, thank you very much for your attention and if there are some aspects that you are deep in, i will be very happy to uh, answer in the uh, question thank time you. thank you so much Thank you very much. We'll take questions in the end. So let's thank the speaker first. And now uh, the stage goes to Ramiro Ugarte from the Centro de Estudios en Libertad de Expresión y Acceso a la Información from Buenos Aires. Eh? So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me first throw this thing. How do I do this? All right. Okay, so I'm going to discuss uh, regulatory threats. This is a paper that tries to conceptualize this, uh, looking forward to an empirical and comparative research project. Um, threats are normal. Threats are a mechanism of governance in all sorts of fields. They have been mainly studied since the 1970s uh, by economists working on regulated industries and other areas. I have found um, evidence of the use of, of this concept all over the place. Um, and this is the definition we propose of what constitutes a regulatory threat. It's any kind of public or private utterance or action by public officials who hold regulatory power over others in which they express, suggest, or imply, clearly or vividly, their desire to see a subject's conduct move in a particular direction. Um, this is a compass that we have created to try to understand where, what kinds of public officials conduct fall under this, under this definition. It is a very simple compass. It's organized around formal and informal processes and private and public uh, actions. Um, we believe that in our definition, everything falls here. And we have built our definition broadly, basically against three authors, against Timothy, we, uh, Timothy Wu, uh, first, I should say that Americans call this area of the law jawboning um, because of the jawbone that we have here and that we use when we talk. Um, we think that a broader concept is necessary. Against Wu, we do not exclude opinions or reports. He has, he, in, in a paper, that he sort of defends the mechanism of jawboning. Um, he, he considers only very formal kinds of actions and he excludes opinions from reports. Against health tech, we do not talk about legislative uh, threats, but rather regulatory threats to include uh, all sorts of public officials. And against Van Bauer, we reject a normatively loaded taxonomy. Van Bauer claim, uses a concept in which job owning is bad when it's normatively charged, when public officials ask for things that they could not ask in theory. We adopt a much uh, sort of neutral uh, conceptualization. Because from our point of view, pressure via regulatory threat is a normal part of the political life of a constitutional democracy. The issue is more or less under-theorized. It has been studied mainly in the US by legal scholars. There, are, uh, there is a lack of empirical studies, but there are a bunch of uh, US cases, judicial cases, in which this issue has been extensively discussed. The Writers Guild case of 1976 is a very interesting case on the FCC and how the FCC was, pressure, was pressuring uh, uh, television and broadcasters uh, owners into adopting a quote-unquote voluntary policy of the family hour view. And then we have the Missouri versus Biden saga, which is there are a couple of decisions that are of the last few weeks. This uh, practice of job owning or, or threats of regulations challenge basis, basic concepts of the rule of law, and we believe they involve a paradox, because we want our public officials to be effective, we want them to talk to those who are regulated by them, but at the same time, we don't want them to use this mechanism as, as the only way of achieving public policy goals. That's why we have formal processes that, in, that are created to 
ensure transparency, accountability, participation, stakeholder engagements, and so on. When only these mechanisms are used and with the, when these mechanisms are very successful, all these values are sort of sacrificed. And of course, the, the reason why job owning or regulatory threats is uh, an issue is because of the, of the potential abuse. It is the problem that concerns the scholars occurs when uh, public officials ask from individuals or corporations for things that they could not ask or could not get through the formal processes of policy making, either because what they ask is illegal or would be unconstitutional, or because when they, what they ask would allow veto players in the formal process to block the initiative. When they succeed through these informal processes, all those opportunities of objection basically get lost. This seems to be obviously a thing. In the last few weeks, there has been a case by a federal judge that ordered uh, more than 40 public officials in the federal government to uh, stop talking to corporations. The decision was severely restricted by the Fifth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, but it still stands and it should be reviewed by the Supreme Court, I guess. Um, now, this case law, I, I, we don't really go into the case law itself. It's basically a case law that is based on drawing a line between what is permissible government speech and what is an illicit form of threat. Um, this case law suggests that this line drawing is possible, but it's difficult. It doesn't seem to be leading to any manage manageable standard and certainly not towards clear-cut rules that can be administered by those who would be subject to it. Uh, but we take all, basically, this literature and our conceptual paper to do comparative research about it. Um, because we believe that uh, this is a regulatory mechanism that every country uses. Every country threatens companies with actions, and companies are generally very receptive of these threats. They want to keep those channels of communication open, and generally, we, our basic uh, premise is that companies dislike regulation. Um, and so what we want to do is, want, in our empirical research, is to document instances of regulatory threats and uh, document company actions that, are respond, that respond to those threats in order to detect correlations and links between them. Uh, and, the, and we believe this will allow us to better understand how the mechanism works outside of the United States. Now, this has a lot of challenges. Um, First is how to, do we build that database? Uh, we already have a database on change of uh, terms of services and, and policies by corporations. This is a large uh, database that Sele has that has been capturing for a quite a few years now. We have a database of Latin American bills uh, on, on all sorts of internet regulation proposals. And we are building a, data, a database of policy announcements, basically taking stock of the blogs of big tech, tech companies. Um, this poses a few methodological challenges. How do we get, uh, how do we manually load basically data points? Should we have a time limit constraint or should we, should we constrain ourselves by theme? Um, the, one of the very important findings that we have produced so far is that th this issue really comes out through judicial discovery. And this is, of course, very limiting from the point of view of researchers. Um, in this graph, which basically is rather towards the upper right portion of the graph and whiter towards the lower portion of the graph, basically what is more red in this graph is what we can see, what we can observe. What is wider is much more difficult. These are informal meetings, informal emails. They only come out in judicial discovery in the, the cases that I've already mentioned. So we have a challenge in terms of how we would be able to document the data that is needed to assess how the practice works. But what we have so far is basically this, is uh, bills, bills that have been announced but maybe not formally presented, legislative inquiries linked, linked to a specific proposed uh, legislation or not linked to a proposed leg legislation, official administrative action, which is, of course, one of the most important uh, parts of what, how regulatory threats happens, and later public comments and speeches. This, we believe, is observable. We can 
look at it, we can do a research about it. Internal emails, internal communications, and so on, really won't come out simply by looking at publicly available information, and issuing freedom of information requests is, is really impossible for the kind of scope that we're proposing. And the actions produced by platforms are much more documented and can be documented in a, in a much easier way. Um, that's it. Uh, I'll look forward if you have any kind of comments or suggestions, especially in terms of the methodological challenges that we have, that we have will be highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Amir. And our last speaker is Nadia from When You Chris, I believe. And she will talk about youth participation in the IGF ecosystem. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this article comes at the end of my PhD. So this is my last PhD article. And I'm very excited about sharing this with you. It's, a, it's part of a series. Um, last year, I presented a paper on meta participation at the Internet Governance Forum. I looked at the processes at the IGF and how stakeholders can participate, specifically looking at youth, and how they started to create their own spaces when they felt that the status quo couldn't be, um, uh, be changed in the processes that already exist. They would create their own. But now, I would like to uh, look at youth participation on regional and global level. So first, I looked at the participation and how um, they were creating new spaces. But I was actually looking this time at the flow of how participants enter um, these spaces and how do we continue their participation starting from um, your environment uh, at an entrance level. So in this case, youth dig the Youth Dialogue on Internet Governance, which is the EURDIC, the European Dialogue on Internet Governance uh, pre-event. So the reason why I wanted to study this is because the United Nations Secretary General is asking in our common uh, uh, agenda to look at mechanisms for uh, youth participation engagement. And so this participation study started in 2022, which was the EU Year of the Youth and the ASEAN Year of the Youth, and continues into 2023, which is the Commonwealth Year of the Youth. So there has been a lot of focus on how participation of youth um, can change these different spaces that we're seeing um, different regional uh, areas um, focusing on. So starting with youth Day, I wanted to look at, uh, um, uh, at a group uh, which I can uh, navigate through. So starting with Youth Dig, which was institutionalized in 2017, over the, uh, until now there have been 150 Youth Dig participants, and I thought I'm going to send them all an email because they're all on the on same mailing list. I thought that was easy, but it is not. I learned from this mailing list that youth over time change. Youth is very varied and starting, some people submitted their university emails, some people submitted their uh, um, student union affiliation or uh, their, the company that they had set up or their youth organization affiliation. And over time, which can even be six months, youth think is in June, and then, of course, in September, it's the new academic year, or you start your new job, you just graduated. So then youth change. So the survey was not an option to try and identify, uh, identify them. And trying to find 150 people by email is not always uh, a possibility either. Instead, I created a database. And in this database, I collected the, the, the names that I have from Youth Dig, Dig, and the IGF, which is all public data. And, um, and I mapped. Um, which youth dig participants, how many times did they go to Eurodic? How many times did they go to the IGF? And from this, I, um, I was able to identify 40 people who were, who were able to meet the criteria that I set, which was um, they must have attended Eurodic three times or more, so that they have a little bit of the feeling of what it is to be at Eurodic and at IGF. Um, they, or they attended Eurodic and the IGF, or they did not come to Eurodic after their initial year, uh, or they never attended an IGF. So based on these uh, criteria, there were 40 people who met these criteria, of which only 20 people accepted. The 20 people who did not accept ranged in, in reasoning. Some of them said that um, they were not uh, allowed to, um, 
to uh, participate in a study because of the job that they have or a particular affiliation um, that required them to, to be um, independent. Um, some people I couldn't, uh, weren't replying, so I'm not sure I actually had the right email address or if I was addressing the right person because sometimes names are very familiar and then you think you know someone um, and, and trying to reach out to them. So that's uh, also um, a, a problem. And for those who are questioning why there are 21 people uh, in my citations is because there there was a per there are people who are anonymous in there who wanted um, to make public statements but also private statements. So based on this, I uh, used the interview data and desk research data to map participation across a pyramid of participation framework, and I'll elaborate a little bit more about this later. But I just wanted to stress the limitations that I'm not talking about all youth. I'm not talking. I'm not representing everybody and uh, uh, that is part of the what we see as the youth stakeholder group. Um, because of course for every individual, especially for youth, it is very personal. But also it comes from a very European perspective. So uh, the model that I used, frameworks that I use is a Western framework and it has uh, particular ideas uh, behind it such as individualism. And this might not represent accurately the manner of participation um, of youth in other settings. And this was also noticeable in one of the examples that there was one particular event and two people responded to it in, in the same year, the same time, and they both responded differently to it based on, on, on their cultural acknowledgement of that particular opportunity. And I went in that case with how they felt about their opportunity rather than acknowledging um, that uh, those are two uh, very different uh, culture components. I focus on the feelings of participation, of how they felt that their purpose was in the participation. I also want to note that the data includes COVID-19 times, which means that there were two virtual youth digs. That meant that um, there's a, there is an overlap or well, well, there's a separation, there's a difference between those who are able to attend on site, which is far more cultural um, and far more um, um, community building and, and, and that type of engagement, and those who had to do it online um, and be far more individual. And uh, I mentioned before, this is public particip participation data, but that comes also with its limitations as a registration form. Um, it, you can choose whether you're not publicly listed or not. Um, that is then a, a limitation whether or not we can actually find uh, participants according to the database. So I would like to introduce to you the Pyramid of Participation, which is a revision of Arnstein's Ladder. Arnstein's Ladder is very famous in a variety of different fields, so sustainability and um, working on uh, community work um, and very many other places. The reason why uh, I chose to do a revision of Arnstein's ladder, which looked at non-participation, tokenism, and citizen power, it's because there's a lot of notion that it is a ladder, so you build yourself up. And the examples that are used to um, map across Arnstein's ladder is always um, per a uh, step of the ladder. So there's a step of ladder and there's an associated point. A step of ladder is another associated point. But how I see the Internet Governance Forum, I see it as an ecosystem. I see that there's moments in time and even at the same time that people navigate through themselves through the system. So if you look at the uh, pyramid, you see as a newcomer, you're integrating into the system. So you're informing. So um, you're sitting here today right now and you're listening to me talk about something that I find interesting and that I want to share with you. And during this, uh, you're being informed about the different uh, content points, but also about the process of seeing how things work. At the same time, you may decide at some point that you want to do an intervention. So then you're contributing something to the content of the session. So then you're uh, forming a part of, the, of, of integrating by consulting. You're consulting the rest of the group. But at some point, perhaps next year, you decide you want to participate at the IGF and you want to organize a session yourself. You go into then different roles, so taking on leadership roles, and then you can go into perhaps partnership where you're working together with other places or even delegated power that you are given a role uh, by the IGF to take on specific topics such as the people who are uh, forming part of the dynamic coalitions or who are uh, uh, individual experts who then participate. So you, um, so you see that throughout the time you're both, um, you have the opportunity to be part of the ecosystem that is continuously evolving and rotating. 
And even though um, perhaps at some point you're in a position of leadership, in another point at the IGF, you are just starting to integrate. You come here in the IGF, but maybe you will go back to your regional organization or your uh, national IGF to kind of contribute there. What is outside the scope of this paper is the complete top of the pyramid, which is meta participation, um, uh, because that's the paper that I've uh, written and presented at Giganet last year. So I, I, if you were interested in looking how different spaces were created, at the IGF uh, by youth, please, um, uh, you can look at the presentation on the GigaNet website. So what is outside the scope of this paper is, um, I look at meaningful participation, so i not looking at tokenized uh, purposes. So when meaningful participation has failed in this process, then I am uh, analyzing that through the lens of why and how they were not able to meaningfully participate rather than going into the particular processes. So using the framework, I created tables in which I outlined, and you see a very tiny example, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it bigger. It's a far, it's a far bigger uh, table, but it basically analyzed and looked at the different purposes. And then I looked at specific topics, participants informing and consulting at Yurdic. So um, using the interviews from the Yurdic participants, um, they expressed that when they are participating, they're learning content and processes. They talk about the structure, accessibility, and community building that leads to particular responsibilities. But when we're looking at what makes them fall out of this ecosystem is when personal reasons uh, uh, come up. For example, if you started a family and can't leave them, or structural reasons when there's so many information or documents that you can't manage. Um, you look at youth participants submitting an issue. Proposing issues are easy, but it's not always easy to take up leadership positions. And when youth org teams uh, get involved, for them, what is really great, they have delegated power because YouthDig alumni organize the YouthDig. So it's always created by the people who went through the process themselves in its last iteration and then um, use that information. How would they have organized the event um, if, they had, uh, if they had the chance to do it? This is them doing it. I looked at the IGF as well, and for this I had to have a separate table navigating what was the purpose and how youth uh, thought about their participation. Uh, among the examples are participants that come from a regional event often attend the IGF because they have particular connections or mentors that encourage them to participate, uh, especially by inviting to volunteer or speak. Um, but sometimes uh, the struggle they face is lack of meaningful, meaningful interactions, um, or they're encouraged to be token actors. So I am LGBT, I'm a woman, and that's why you should go to the IGF. And that really discourages young people to participate because they feel that they're being put in a particular space. So uh, as my last remark, uh, this was uh, the final article of my uh, research on youth participation. And tomorrow I will actually launch my final publication, which is a juridic publication that specifically looks at the philosophy of uh, youth participation at uh, YouthDIC. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. And I'm very excited to continue this discussion over the next few days. Uh, there are several uh, other sessions that the IGF is uh, um, conducting. The IGF um, itself is presenting a case study uh, later this week, and the Youth Atlas, uh, it's in its second iteration, will be presenting about youth activities at the IGF. I hope to be able to see you to continue the discussion on youth participation at the IGF further there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much Nadia. Thank you very much to, to all the three speakers. I think we have a very interesting, three very interesting papers, very well written, a pleasure to read, actually. I will briefly try to emphasize some ideas and raise some points that the panel may like uh, or not to address in a later stage. So starting with Nicolas' paper, his starting point is a very clear conceptualization of digital sovereignty from two different perspectives, a very classical one, emphasizing the right of the state to control digital infrastructures and data flow, uh, claiming their their need to protect uh, critical infrastructures or in a more ambiguous way to protect their way of living. And the, the second one 
broader, if I can say so, a more rights-based one, associated with the capability of a citizens, communities, a social, a civil society dynamics to control and decide about digital processes in which they are involved. Then the paper identifies a number of ambiguities in the interpretation of these two perspectives uh, that places this debate in a sort of a minus field, and I think this is the real interesting contribution of the paper. Um, uh, for example, the classical conceptualization goes a big step forward to what uh, Nicholas called the extraterritorial projection of power, uh, which has some points with Ramiro's uh, paper as well. And on the other hand, the rights-based conceptualization is actually differently perceived um, depending on which part of the globe we, we are. Um, one may feel reassured with active privacy protection, uh, for example, in, uh, with the uh, European GDRP or with the New Zealand protection of um, indigenous communities, which is something that you, you, you may like to, 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 to sit in, your, in the paper. Uh, but on the other hand, I agree uh, uncomfortable with increasing state uh, control uh, by digital means. On the other hand, uh, and, uh, and from a, a different point of view, uh, the not so uncommon appropriation of this sort of rights-based approach by transnational private tech companies featuring themselves as potential civil society agents. There is a, a bunch of literature about this misunderstanding that maybe it will be interesting to look at. So, coming to some raising some issues, I would say that if the romantic view of the self-governing internet is neither true nor operational, uh, as the Nicholas also claim, the current state of affairs is a source of serious problems, misunderstandings, and eventually conflicts. And we are left with a lot of questions. Uh, to begin with, the role of states is uh, unavoidable in this game. Uh, but quoting from a, a definition, I think from the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia that is, comes in the paper, their authority is obtained, and now I quote, from a mutually recognized source of legitimacy. And this is the crucial point here, yes? Uh, to what extent states can be trusted, we may ask? Um, do they actually represent a global public interest in cyberspace? But if not, who do? And this is, this is a, a, a concern. A, a second issue may be related with uh, the fact that this debate is clearly an arena for international institutions and dialogue. Uh, namely, in the increasing decisive United Nations context. Uh, you already mentioned digital compact uh, in the your presentation. Uh, is there a possible roadmap? Uh, in it, there will be a place for nations without states, for refugees, for displaced people, indigenous communities, as the New Zealand law I, I mentioned, and so on. Okay. Uh, one of the means that states use to shape global digital landscape is regulation and standardization. And Ramiro's papers focus on a specific kind of processes states resort to constrain this ecosystem, discussing in the paper regulatory threats of very different flavors. I think you did a great job in characterizing them in a very precise way as a specific but largely diverse mechanism of power, and I will underline this largely diverse mechanism of power, which is particularly relevant in terms of internet governance, I, I think, and so relevant in this, in this forum. In particular, uh, around what Ramiro calls enforcing voluntary schemes of compliance with public positions and goals. And it might be interesting to expand research through systematic discourse analysis as one perceives from your examples, language is always performative. We know this from the 70s, yeah? Uh, and do it in concrete case studies. I, I liked very much your, your, your uh, detailed illustrations, uh, but probably one will need to go a step further in research to be able to identify and document concrete correlations, if there are <laughs> correlations, effectively. Methodologically, for me, this is the most interesting domain for case studies, even if they are not trivial at all to carry on. Uh, threats are characterized in your paper along these two axes. Uh, you have shown uh, uh, public, private, formal, informal, 
providing an operational tool to somehow guide understanding and acting in this domain. Uh, threats are ubiquitous, often effective, often producing results quicker and even more informed than, uh, than other means. And on the other hand, as we all know, they reduce transparency, institutional accountability, and so on and so forth. My point is that in some sense, they also are unavoidable at least, as Ramiro rightly recalls, through the implicit threat of revision underlying any legislative process. So the point is how to raise awareness of the civil society around this. Uh, extremely important uh, from my perspective, but I don't know if you agree, is how to increase digital literacy, informed, empowered citizens and dynamics to protect democracies in your case. And if you come back to Nicola's paper, also because we doubt that this rights-based perspective uh, claiming more self-determination and distributed power will not flourish anyway. Again, uh, we could ask, is there a role in this area for the international arena, in particular for the UN, uh, as at the very least a collector of good practices and an instance of debate? A side note to uh, the way you put the references along your footnotes, I found it uh, a bit strange from my taste, but very effective in, in providing a very interesting reading. And the, the last paper, um, at first sight, Nadia, your, your paper seems thematically a little bit on, 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 on another side, but I think this is somehow illusory because you discuss through a very concrete and planned participatory research framework that you explain, and this is part of your PhD, as you mentioned. Uh, what ensures youth meaningful participation in the IGF family of events. Yeah? So that's very concrete focus. IGF, with its distributed format at regional and sectorial levels, provides, I agree, a most interesting background to discuss all these issues. If extrapolation is possible, and uh, if extrapolation is, is possible, and, and, and certainly this is a quantitative, uh, a qualitative research, so we, we always uh, need to be um, a bit careful about that. Um, we, we, this has the clear merit to uh, provide unexpected insights and raise crisp questions, and the outcomes of this work can help to make operational, as you mentioned, the statement of our common agenda, somehow to enhance youth engagement and to take future generations into account in policy decisions participation. Again, we can look at this paper, uh, also quite well structured, uh, within the very clear borders, the IGF ecosystem. But what, in my opinion, makes it, it relevant for this debate this afternoon is the identification of mechanisms and conditions for what you call meaningful participation. As youth, of course, that's your, <laughs> that's your topic. But also, we could probably extend this or put the same questions for participation of old people or pensionists or different sorts of minority groups or disabled people or refugees or whatever. This is possibly not a challenge for Nadia, even if bringing these sort of voices within IGF could be interesting to consider in the future. But uh, in any case, designing and implementing more effective and meaningful voicing mechanisms for people and communities, providing them with time and voice, is becoming a major issue for the governments of internet itself. And that's why I think your work is well connected with, within this session. So this is how I see these uh, three very well written papers, as I mentioned. Thank you very much for them. Um, we may also open the floor to the audience for um, any questions, and then we'll go for a second round between the panelists. Yes, please. Uh, my question is to Nicola. Um, can, can, can you please I, identify yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Barna Akchiliger from Queen Mary University of London. And um, I really enjoyed Nicola's paper because I'm also um, I'm looking forward to reading the uh, full paper, but I, I also try and analyze these uh, same concepts and materialize them through case studies. So it was a um, it was an interesting um, paper for me. So uh, the one question I have for him is that in what capacity does he think that multi-stakeholder platforms can contribute to solidifying the digital sovereignty 
um, concept without escalating geopolitical uh, tensions. Any, any other question from the audience? Okay, so we can now go. Um, I, I, I was going to propose to do it in reverse order, but as this question was directed to Nicholas, maybe we can take the, <laughs> the same order this time. Nicholas, please. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, thank you very much, Luis, for your very um, enlightening comments. And in particular, I think that, uh, yes, one point you raised um, uh, um, a very important uh, issues in this dynamic and debate, and this is the role uh, of state that, as you say, is really uh, unavoidable, uh, but it could be also really tricky. And I think this, this uh, uh, dynamic need to be understood uh, together with, as you or underline, with uh, the weakness and ineffectiveness of international uh, institution that in the last decades has been for several reasons unable to uh, create a common framework for the internet and the digital world. And this created the rooms for uh, uh, the rise of digital sovereignty claims that, uh, as I tried to show in my paper, they create uh, um, tension and geopolitical conflicts that make even harder than to reach uh, an, an agreement that uh, is, uh, uh, is very needed at, at the moment. And uh, it's not easy to identify a way in which to move forward also because the tensions seem that are deemed to increase also in the following years. Um, but uh, anyway, I do not see any other uh, paths than uh, constitutionalize also the international law order um, and then to arrive some kind of agreement in which, yes, states could accept their digital sovereignty because this is absolutely necessary also to guarantee uh, the right of their children or the, to guarantee the fundamental right in the digital world, but they need also to be constrained by some superior uh, um, uh, law and rules uh, that uh, uh, impede that uh, um, digital mean and use it to uh, violate human rights and also to conduct undue uh, uh, interferences in the life of the other uh, countries. And uh, I said, yes, there are some discussion as we underline on the global digital compact, but we know it could be too much ambitious to be maybe unrealistic to think that we can really reach an agreement that is able to uh, achieve these goals. Another solution that is what I um, suggested with the Convention 108 is to create some um, uh, more limited regional agreement, but between uh, like-minded like states and nation to uh, have at least, uh, uh, you know, um, something that is fragmented, but it could be also strong enough have a, a critical mass um, to be attractive also for the other country, proposing a model that is based on digital constitutionalist principles. And while well, coming to the uh, the other question about the capability, the capacity of multi stakeholders to contribute to this process, I think that uh, what we are saying is uh, doing also in part the, the failure of the model of the uh, multi stakeholderism also because, um, yes, um, um, to, to be clear, we need the participation of a wide range of different actors and uh, a good model could be the framework convention under the United States uh, umbrella like us already happened in the um, uh, environmental um, international policy making. And this uh, in this process, there's also room for the participation of civil society, uh, private sector, technical community, and also the possibility for them to uh, give the contribution in something that, and some output that is binding. Um, uh, this binding. Uh, yes, but when we come to the uh, internet and digital realm, we can see that the multi-stakeholderism 
um, uh, very often has been used all just to uh, create initiatives that have no binding outcome or uh, in uh, other contexts where uh, they are more related to the concrete uh, management operation um, of the internet, uh, they also have, the, they reproduce some um, power uh, inequalities between the different members participating to these initiatives that in the end left uh, um, uh, the effective power uh, um, in the uh, and uh, of a few actors, uh, uh, very often we know uh, big tech companies uh, and also the US government. And this is another factor that can contribute to create a mistrust uh, at the international level and um, impair the reach of uh, uh, international agreement. So I think we have to move forward. I think we have to try to recover the role of international uh, institution um, and ground uh, any further step on international law. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just very briefly, the. I'm glad you noticed the footnotes. The footnotes are to blame in my U.S. legal education. That's how U.S. lawyers write for some reason, and I have captured that uh, habit. Um, now, on the question on how to shed light on this, I have to say I have almost not seen the issue discussed outside of the United States. I have found literature that has discussed it in other contexts, but on internet governance, the only one that I've known that has written about it is Michael Karanikolas. He has written about the uh, job owning in India and Canada. That's as, as far as it goes so far. Now, in terms of uh, how to shed light on this, in the US this is a legal problem. And because it is a legal problem, it leads to litigation. And it leads to litigation because basically people feel, you know, that, that they are uh, in a way harmed by the outcome of this informal process processes of rulemaking, and this is what the Missouri Vividing case is about. It's a bunch of people who are claiming that they were censored by companies, uh, but the invisible hand of the federal government was behind that censoring. Uh, and, and that is an interesting case. I haven't seen it elsewhere. What I have seen, though, it's uh, threats being made as a mechanism of governance outside of the United States. Of course, this is used everywhere. For instance, in Latin America, I have seen bills presented as a way of forcing companies to sit at a certain table. I don't know what they get out of it, but I've certainly seen bills being introduced to force companies to, to sit at certain places. Um, the judicial litigation in Latin America about intermediary liability, for instance, is a, an obvious source of potential regulatory threat in a different form, in the, in the form of a judicial decision that sets a specific standard. I know uh, officials in companies do perceive this as regulatory threats, and they pass that information up the ladder. Um, and then I, perhaps the, the most interesting case that I have seen is the way electoral authorities in Latin America have uh, successfully managed to persuade corp uh, internet companies to see that certain informal, informal mechanism, mechanisms of coordination around this information. Like this has emerged as the so-called Mexico model, uh, but it has been done by Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina at least. Uh, uh, and this works, and this creates channels of communication with companies in which the potential of pressuring is obviously there. Um, what we have seen in terms of possible avenues for further research is that processes and interactions between states and companies are uh, incre increasingly being formalized. The DSA is obviously uh, a good example. The DSA establishes a bunch of uh, claims and prerogatives and obligations on corporations and create a, a formal process in which this can happen. There is an opportunity there in terms of thinking about forcing these processes to, to be documented to see if these uh, processes are transparent and, and so on. Um, but that's the research that we want to do.
Thank you very much. So Nadia, please. Well, thank you very much for your kind comments. I'm very pleased that um, that my research is now done, but also I'm excited at the challenges ahead for the United Nations, but also regional organizations worldwide who are looking to foster youth participation in their policy making. Notably, one of the things that I hope to achieve during this IGF is um, looking revisiting the definition of meaningful participation. And specifically, I was looking at the definition by Malcolm, which aims to capture the extent to which the processes in question are effectively designed to incorporate the viewpoints of youth participation into the development of internet governance policies in a balanced way, this being the essential feature for, from which this sublet of multi-stakeholder processes can claim democratic legitimacy. And I think that um, starting with this uh, point of meaningful participation and adopting that as a definition, you, then using the framework to kind of further uh, reflect on the manner in which we're allowing participation within the internet governance ecosystem. And I quite concur, there is opportunities um, for uh, for this type of growth into uh, the elderly or minorities, and I, that would be very welcome to me. And if there is someone who would want, who'd like to fund me to do that research, I'm perfectly happy to do so. And, um, but the thing that I would, um, uh, what uh, I did want to emphasize with the methodology is that I use the European framework and different cultures are extremely very important in that regard, especially when we talk about minorities and how they interpret the manner in which we engage with each other and how we uh, perceive our participation and what meaning that has to them. So the, the purpose that I looked at was something that I was familiar with by living in that space. And therefore, I would encourage that if there was a researcher looking at another region, that that region would also be supported uh, uh, by someone from that space uh, that is included uh, to ensure that we understand the nuances that come from body languages when we talk about uh, our understanding of our purposes within internet governance and participating in there. So thank you very much for your comments. I think um, I, that uh, we're just at the very start of how we can contribute further and I'm very excited to see it happen. Thank you very much. I don't know if there is any other question from the audience. I, I guess that some people in this room, maybe people as old as myself, will re re recall a, a movie from um, the 80s, I think, Woody Allen movie, uh, movie in which uh, it at some point it says, oh, the, um, the answer is yes, but would you mind to repeat the question? So I think we leave quite a lot this, this feeling in cyberspace uh, governance. Uh, and so I thank you very much, Nicolas, Ramiro, Nadia, for your, for your participation. And, all the audience, and I think you can close now. Thank you.